The Theosophical Society in America presents Dr. Fritjof Capra in a talk entitled The Tao of Physics, The Relationship Between Science and the Ancient Wisdom. Well, in this lecture I'm going to explore the relationship between science and mysticism. And this means that I'm going to talk about two kinds of knowledge or two modes of consciousness which have always been recognized as very basic properties of human nature, of the human mind. They are usually called the rational and the intuitive and they have been associated traditionally with science and with religion. The Chinese have called them the yang and the yin and it's interesting to note that in Chinese culture these two poles of human nature have never been seen as belonging to different categories but always as being just different aspects of one and the same reality extreme poles of a single whole in the Chinese view all manifestations of reality and that includes the manifestations of human nature are generated by the dynamic interplay of these two archetypal poles, the yang and the yin. And to give you an idea of how the Chinese saw this interplay, let me quote from an ancient Chinese text. The yang, having reached its climax, retreats in favor of the yin. The yin, having reached its climax, retreats in favor of the yang. So they saw it as a cyclical interplay where one advances, the other retreats, and then the other one advances, and uh, the first retreats. I think it's interesting and very instructive to observe the attitudes of our society with regard to these two poles of human nature. The yang aspect is the masculine side of human nature. It's the active, rational, competitive, scientific side. The yin aspect is the feminine side of human nature. It's the yielding, intuitive, cooperative, mystical side. And if you keep those two, uh, the words uh, describing those two aspects in your minds, then you will see immediately that our society has consistently emphasized the yang over the yin. It has emphasized activity over contemplation, rational knowledge over intuitive wisdom, competition over cooperation, science over religion, and so on. Furthermore, instead of recognizing that the personality of each man and of each woman comes about through an interplay of masculine and feminine elements, we have established a rigid order where all men are supposed to be masculine and all women are supposed to be feminine. And Together with emphasizing the masculine or yang elements, our society has given men the leading roles and most of its privileges and has suppressed women. Now, in this analysis, we can even go further. We can say that together with women, our society has repressed all the forces that operate predominantly in the yin mode. And to give you just a few examples, it has suppressed blacks, American Indians, homosexuals, psychics, and so on. Now these are very different groups of people, but they all have this in common, that they operate predominantly in the yin mode, and our society has not allowed them to really express themselves through that mode. However, we are now witnessing the beginning of a tremendous evolutionary movement as the Chinese text says, the yang, having reached its extreme, it retreats in favor of the yin. And this is what we are now uh, witnessing. We are seeing a rising concern with ecology. Uh, we are witnessing a strong interest in mysticism, in uh, psychic phenomena, a rediscovery of holistic approaches to health and healing, and uh, last not least, a rising feminist awareness. Now I think that all these movements and all these phenomena are manifestations of this evolutionary trend from an overemphasis to the yang 
to a balance between yang and yin. And evolutionary trends are of a magnitude and of a scope that they will take place whether we resist them or not. Uh, the question is just whether we are able to recognize them and work with them or become frustrated in, in our lives in resisting them. Now this is how I see my own work in this context. I see my own work of relating science to mysticism as a contribution to this movement. And I have used the Chinese yin-yang symbol to picture the relationship that I see existing between science and mysticism. And I'd like to show this on a slide that I've brought. If I could have the first slide on, please. Now what I've done is I've pictured uh, the yin, Chinese yin-yang symbol. I've taken the Chinese yin-yang symbol and I've pictured science by mathematics, symbolized it with mathematical formulas and mysticism by the face of a meditating Buddha. So this is, I see, the relation between science and mysticism. I see science as an extreme manifestation, as the result of an extreme specialization of the rational mind. And mysticism as the result of an extreme specialization of the intuitive mind. Now, both are entirely different approaches, but they are complementary. And by that I mean that neither of them is comprehended in the other, neither of them is contained in the other, neither of them can be reduced to the other, but both approaches supplement one another and are necessary to obtain a fuller picture of reality. Uh, thank you for the slide. Now, in the 20th century, physics has had a profound influence on this understanding of reality achieved through the scientific uh, rational mode. The exploration of the atomic and subatomic world has shown an unsuspected limitation of classical ideas and has forced us to modify many of our basic concepts about reality in a drastic way. For example, the picture of matter is totally different in subatomic physics from the traditional idea of a material substance that was held in classical physics. And the same is true for concepts like space, or time, or cause and effect, object, and so on. But these are concepts that are very fundamental to our whole outlook on the world around us. And with their radical transformation, our whole worldview has begun to change. Out of these changes, a new worldview is now emerging, a view which turns out to be closely related to the views of mystics of all ages and traditions. And in this way, modern physics is making a direct contact to that other mode of awareness, to the yin, the intuitive, or the mystical mode of consciousness. I personally have been particularly interested in Eastern mysticism, that is, in the religious philosophies of Hinduism, Buddhism, and Taoism. And I'm going to show you how the worldview of these spiritual traditions is very close to the views that now are emerging from the theories of modern atomic and subatomic physics. Now, before discussing these similarities, let me briefly describe the old view, the view that was changed by the discoveries of modern physics. This was the view of classical physics, and you could also call it the traditional Western worldview. This view had been a mechanistic view of the world. It had its origin in the philosophy of the Greek atomists way back in the 5th century BC, a school of philosophy that saw matter as being made of several basic building blocks, which they called the atoms. And these were seen as hard and solid chunks of matter that were totally passive and inert. And these passive basic building blocks of matter were moved by external forces. Forces that were totally different from matter, of a totally different nature, and that were often associated with the spiritual realm. And in this way, a dichotomy was created, an image that became essential to the general Western way of thinking in subsequent centuries. It gave rise to the dualism between spirit and matter. 
between the mind and the body, between the I within the body and the world outside. This dualism was formulated, perhaps in its sharpest form, in the philosophy of Descartes in the 17th century. Descartes based his whole view of nature on a fundamental division between two separate and independent realms, that of mind and that of matter. And because of this Cartesian division, scientists of the 17th century were able to see the world as being completely separate from themselves and as consisting of separate objects that worked together in some kind of a huge machine. Matter was completely dead and separate from the scientific observer. Such a mechanistic view of the world was held by Newton, who constructed his mechanics on this philosophical basis and made it the foundation of physics, of what is now known as classical physics. From the second half of the 17th century to the end of the 19th, the mechanistic Newtonian model dominated all scientific thought. And in fact, its dominance is still quite strong today in many of the sciences. And I hope we'll have an opportunity of discussing this either tonight or tomorrow. The influence of the Newtonian worldview on, say, biology, on medicine, on psychology, uh, and so on. Now, in contrast to the mechanistic view, the Eastern view of the world could be described or characterized by words like organic or holistic or ecological. It's a view in which the world is not seen as being made of separate objects, but rather as being fundamentally interrelated, fundamentally interconnected. All the phenomena we perceive with our senses are seen as being just different manifestations of one and the same reality. And our tendency to divide the perceived world into individual objects and events and to experience ourselves as isolated entities, as isolated individuals in this world, this tendency, so the mystics tell us, comes from our categorizing intellect, from our uh, categorizing rational mentality. Now, of course, they grant us that it's very useful and necessary to divide the world into separate objects at the everyday practical level. When we come into this uh, lecture room, for example, we deal with different chairs and different people and different people sitting on different chairs and so on. And we're very successful in dealing with the world in those terms. However, this is not a fundamental feature of reality. Fundamentally, there are no separate objects. And therefore, for the Eastern mystic, any such objects have a fluid and ever-changing character. Because what you call an object, they say, depends to a great extent on the mode of consciousness you're operating in. And so the outlines of objects are fluid and ever-changing. The Eastern worldview is always a dynamic view. And when I say the Eastern worldview, I really should say the mystical worldview, because there have been mystics, as you know, in all uh, traditions, in all cultures, in East and West. Just for simplicity, I'll call it the Eastern worldview. So this is always a dynamic view of the world, which contains time and change as essential features. The cosmos is seen as one inseparable reality, which is forever in motion, alive, organic, spiritual and material at the same time. I shall now try to show you how the main features of this picture appear in modern physics. Now, when I say modern physics, I mean the physics of the 20th century, which began at the very beginning of our century with sensational and totally unexpected experimental results. At that time, scientists were able, for the first time, to penetrate into matter to an extent that they could make experiments with atoms. They could probe into atomic structures. And what they found was totally unexpected and very surprising to them. Up to then, they had always thought that atoms were hard and solid particles, the basic building blocks of matter. Now they saw that atoms consisted essentially of empty space. There's a tiny nucleus in an atom and then there are electrons whirling around that nucleus 
in a relatively vast space. Now, it's very difficult to get a feeling for the order of magnitude of atoms because they're so small, they're so far removed from our everyday sensory perception that words like extremely small uh, don't uh, really describe the picture very well. And then I say there's a relatively vast space around the nucleus. So we have great difficulties in dealing with these orders of magnitude. Of course, I could tell you that the diameter of an atom is about a hundred millionth of an inch. But then again, this doesn't make too much sense because whether it's a millionth of an inch or a ten millionth or a hundred millionth really doesn't matter. It's so small that we can't visualize it anyway. But what we can do is we can make models and analogies. And I've constructed such an analogy uh, which asks how many atoms are there in an orange? And that's the same as asking how small is an atom, a sort of similar type of question. And you all know the size of an orange, so you have one scale. So what we'll do now in our minds is to blow up the orange until we can see the atoms. And uh, we'll blow it up, well, it turns out we have to blow it up to the size of the Earth to be able to see the atoms. Now in an orange of the size of the Earth, and here you have another scale that uh, you're familiar with, in such an orange, the atoms have the size of cherries. So now imagine a whole Earth tightly packed with cherries. Right? <laughs> this is a magnified picture of an orange and its atoms. And then take the Earth and shrink it down again to the, to the orange and imagine what the cherries do in proportion and you get an idea of how small an atom is. So you see, an atom is extremely small compared to macroscopic objects. On the other hand, it is huge compared to the nucleus in its center. And to see that, well, we do the same trick again. We'll take out a cherry and see how big the nucleus of this cherry-sized atom is. Well, the nucleus is so small that you can't see it, so we'll blow up the cherry and we'll blow it up, say, to the size of a football. Well, you still can't see the nucleus. And if we blew up this atom to a size of a sphere that, say, could sit here on, on this stage, on this podium, you could still not see the nucleus because it's so small. So we'll go to another extreme and blow up this atom again to a huge size, say, the size of a huge dome, something like the Houston Astrodome. Now imagine an atom of the size of the Houston Astrodome. In an atom of that size, the nucleus has the size of a grain of salt. And I've worked out the dimensions. It, 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 this is really the correct relation. So imagine the Houston Astrodome, a grain of salt in its center, and specks of dust whirling around in the huge space. That's a magnified picture of an atom, its nucleus, and its electrons. So now you see why I can say the space is relatively vast. And you can see why atomic physicists were so surprised by the results at the beginning of the century. Now, they thought then, well, we were wrong with the atoms. They are not the hard and solid particles we were looking for. But maybe these particles inside the atom, the protons and neutrons inside the nucleus, and the electrons whirling around in that space, maybe these are the basic building blocks out of which everything is made. And they called them elementary particles. And it turned out that they were very wrong again. And this came about about 20 years later, when quantum theory was worked out, the mathematical basis of atomic physics, a theory known as quantum mechanics or quantum theory. Quantum theory showed that the subatomic units of matter are very abstract entities. Depending on how you look at them, they can appear either as particles or as waves. And this was, of course, very surprising because these two pictures are very different. A particle is something located in a small area of space. A wave is something that is spreads out over a large region of space. And physicists then ask themselves, well, how can an electron, for instance, be a particle and a wave at the same time? This was really extremely puzzling. Now, the apparent contradiction between these two pictures was finally solved, again, in a completely unexpected way. In a way, which gave a blow to the very foundation of the mechanistic picture of the world. 
namely to the idea of the reality of matter. It turns out that at the subatomic level, matter does not exist with certainty in various places, but rather shows what has been called tendencies to exist. So you cannot say that an electron exists in front of this room or in the back or on the left side or on the right side. You can only say it has a tendency to be rather in the front than in the back or rather on the left than on the right. And this is not because we don't know where it really is. It really is not at any particular place. It is everywhere at the same time, so to speak. It has tendencies to exist in various places. Now, in quantum theory, we don't talk about tendencies any longer. We're more precise and we talk about probabilities and we have got a whole theory to go with it. And we associate the probabilities uh, that give us information about particles to be in various places and about processes to happen at various times and so on. We associate these probabilities with mathematical quantities that turn out to be the same quantities we use to describe waves in physics whenever they appear. Uh, waves, of course, are a very common phenomenon and uh, whenever we encounter them, be they water waves or sound waves, electric waves, elastic waves and so on, whenever we describe waves, we can use the same mathem mathematical quantities to describe them. And here in quantum theory, these mathematical structures are used again, but this time the waves are much more abstract. They're not real three-dimensional waves like water waves or sound waves. They are what we call probability waves. That is, they are abstract mathematical quantities with all the characteristic properties of waves which are related to the probabilities of finding the particles at particular places and at particular times. So you see then that at the atomic level, the solid material objects of classical physics have now somehow dissolved into wave-like patterns of probabilities. And this again is puzzling again because you will ask how can the physical world, which is seemingly so solid and tangible, how can this, this hard and solid world consist of mere probabilities? This is not something uh, it's very easy to accept. Now, the answer to this question comes about through a careful analysis of the process of observation in atomic physics. Such an analysis shows you that subatomic particles have no meaning as isolated entities, but have only meaning as interconnections between the preparation of an experiment and the subsequent measurement. So these probabilities are not probabilities of things, but rather probabilities of interconnections. This, this needs uh, some careful analysis, uh, which would be too long to, to go into right now. But the result is that you are forced to accept the fact that subatomic particles are not things, but are in interconnections between things. And then you ask, of course, well, what do they interconnect? What are those things? And you study them in the framework of atomic physics, and you find that they again are interconnections between other things, which you then go on to study to find that they are interconnections between yet other things and so on. And this never ends. You never end up with any things at all. You always end up with interconnections. And this is maybe the crucial lesson of atomic physics, this is how quantum theory reveals a basic oneness of the universe. It shows that we cannot decompose the world into independently existing smallest units. As we penetrate into matter, nature does not show us any basic, isolated, basic building blocks, but rather appears as a complicated web or network of relations, of relations between various parts of an integrated unified whole. Let me quote here Werner Heisenberg, one of the founders of atomic physics, who says the following about this point. The world thus appears as a complicated tissue of events in which connections of different kinds alternate or overlap or combine and thereby determine the texture of the whole. But this is 
very much the way in which mystics have experienced the world as a network or web of relations. And very often they have expressed their experience in words which are almost identical to the words used by atomic physicists. Let me just give you one example, and this is taken from a book by Lama Govinda, the Tibetan Buddhist, who writes the following. The external world and his inner world are for the Buddhist only two sides of the same fabric in which the threads of all forces and of all events, of all forms of consciousness and of their objects are woven into an inseparable net of endless mutually conditioned relations. So this is uh, the first basic uh, point that I want to make, the experience of the world as a network or web of relations, both in modern physics and in the mystical traditions. Let me now come to another subatomic phenomenon, which is, by the way, closely related to the wave nature of particles. And this is a very peculiar behavior of subatomic particles. The behavior is the following. Whenever you confine a particle like a proton or an electron to a small area of space, then this particle will react to this confinement in a very strange way. It reacts by moving around. And the smaller you make the area of confinement, the faster the particle will jiggle around in this area. So metaphorically speaking, if you put a particle in a box, then the particle will jiggle around in that box. And as you make the box smaller, the particle will jiggle around faster and faster. Now this, of course, is totally different from any known everyday behavior of objects. If you put a tennis ball in a box, then the tennis ball will just sit there and it doesn't care whether the box is large or small. It'll just lie in that box. Not so an electron. An electron will jiggle around. And as you make the area of confinement smaller, it'll jiggle around faster. But this means that matter is fundamentally restless because most of the material particles are confined in nature. They are confined by atomic structures, molecular structures, and nuclear structures. And therefore, they are never at rest, but always show this inherent tendency to move about. Macroscopically, a piece of iron or a piece of stone may seem dead or inert. But when you magnify such a piece of stone, then you see that it is full of activity. And the smaller the dimensions you go to, the more hectic and violent and uh, intense becomes the activity. Well, first of all, we know that all structures in our environment are composed of molecules, that is, of, of atoms bound together in various ways, linked up in various ways. And these structures are not rigid and motionless, but dynamic. Atoms move in molecules, they vibrate. And these vibrations of atoms are experienced as heat. Heat is nothing but the energy of motion of vibrating atoms and molecules. Now, in these vibrating atoms, then, electrons are bound to the atomic nucleus by electric forces that keep them within a small volume. And they react to this confinement by motion. This is how you can understand the whirling around of electrons around the nucleus. And then within the nucleus, we have a much smaller volume. We have a minute volume into which protons and neutrons are pressed by the strong nuclear force. And as a consequence, they react to this extreme confinement with much higher velocities. So they race about in the nucleus. So you see, the modern physics pictures matter not at all as passive and inert, but it's being in a continuous vibrating and dancing motion. And the rhythmic patterns of this motion are given by the molecular structures, the atomic structures, and the nuclear structures. Again, this is very much the way in which Eastern mystics have seen the material world. They all emphasize that the universe has to be grasped dynamically as it moves, as it vibrates, as it dances that nature is not in a static equilibrium, but in a dynamic state of balance. Now, they wouldn't use words like static and dynamic equilibrium. They would use more poetic terms. And to give you an example, I'll quote from a Chinese text, from a Taoist text, which contains in a very beautiful 
poetic way exactly the message we get from modern atomic physics. The stillness in stillness is not the real stillness. Only when there is stillness in movement can the spiritual rhythm appear which pervades heaven and earth. Now, as we penetrate deeper into matter, things become more and more alive, things move faster and faster, and within the atomic nucleus, we get to a situation where the velocities of protons and neutrons in that nucleus often are so high that they come close to the speed of light. This extremely high velocity is very crucial for our description of physical phenomena, because Whenever we deal with phenomena involving these high velocities, we have to take relativity theory into account. So what we need then for a proper description of nuclear phenomena and uh, the interactions between particles at that level is a combination of quantum theory and relativity theory. And this brings me now to the second basic theory of modern physics, Einstein's theory of relativity. Now, I've given you the essence of quantum theory in 10 minutes, and I'll give you the essence of relativity theory in another 10 minutes. Uh, you have probably heard before that relativity theory has brought about a drastic change in our notions of space and time. It has shown that space is not three-dimensional, and that time is not a separate dimension, as had been believed in classical physics. Both space and time are intimately and inseparably connected, and they form a four-dimensional continuum, which we call space-time. In relativity theory, therefore, we can never talk about space without talking about time. And we can never talk about time without also making a statement about space. Now, we have been living with relativity theory for quite a while now. Einstein proposed it in 1905. And we're thoroughly familiar with its mathematical formalism. We, are, uh, we can use it perfectly well. It's a theory that has been proven and verified thousands of times. And we are perfectly familiar with it. I should maybe mention, since Dr. Melvin is going to talk afterwards, that there are two theories of relativities that have very different status. I'm talking here of what is called special relativity and he'll be talking about general relativity, which is used at the realm of the very large in astrophysics and cosmology. And there the status of this theory is not so well confirmed. But at the atomic and subatomic level, we can use Einstein's theory with great confidence, and we are very successful in doing so. However, this has not helped our intuition a great deal, because most of us do not have any direct contact, sensory contact with this four-dimensional space-time reality. And therefore, we have great difficulties of conceptualization, of visualization, and difficulties of language when it comes to situations where we have to apply Einstein's theory. We can do it mathematically, we can predict experiments, and so on. The mathematical theory uh, involves no problems. But when we want to talk about it in ordinary language, we have great problems. Now, a similar situation seems to exist in the mystical traditions. The mystics seem to be able to attain non-ordinary states of consciousness or modes of awareness in which they transcend the three-dimensional world of everyday life, they transcend three-dimensional space, and they transcend ordinary notions of time to experience what they often call a higher dimensional or a multidimensional reality. A reality which, like that of relativity theory, is impossible to describe in ordinary language. And when mystics want to describe their experience in ordinary terms, they are faced with the same difficulties that we have to face in physics. Govinda, again, Lama Govinda, whom I have quoted already, talks about an experience of this kind in the following way. An experience of higher dimensionality is achieved by integration of experiences of different centers and levels of consciousness. Hence the indescribability of certain experiences of meditation on the plane of three-dimensional consciousness. 
Now, the dimensions of these states of consciousness that the Lama is talking about here may not be the same as the ones we're dealing with in uh, relativistic physics, in, in physics uh, using relativity theory. But it is striking that these experiences have led mystics to notions of space and time which are very similar to the notions we have now in relativity theory. Throughout Eastern mysticism, there seems to be a strong intuition for what you could call the space-time character of reality, for the fact that you can never separate space from time, that they are inseparably linked. This fact, which is so characteristic of relativistic physics, is stressed again and again in the mystical traditions. Let me just quote uh, from the Buddhist scholar D.T. Suzuki, who writes in one of his books on Buddhism, as a fact of pure experience, there's no space without time, no time without space. Now this could be an excellent motto for any textbook on relativity theory, because this is exactly the experience we have from Einstein's theory. I think you will realize and appreciate that the concepts of space and time are extremely basic for our description of reality. They are very basic for philosophers, artists, scientists, and just for our everyday way of dealing with the world around us. And therefore, if we modify these so basic concepts in an extreme way, then we will have to expect that we have to modify our whole framework for describing reality. And this is what has actually happened in physics. We had to modify our scientific framework. We are now talking about a relativistic framework, a framework which is characterized by the fusion of space and time into one four-dimensional continuum. This unification of space and time has many important consequences. The most important maybe being the realization that mass is nothing but a form of energy, that every object has energy stored in its mass, even if it is not moving just by, the, by, the nature, by its nature of having a mass, it has energy stored in, there, in that mass. Now, these developments, the unification of space and time, and the equivalence of mass and energy, have had a profound influence on our picture of matter and have forced us to modify our picture of a particle in a very decisive way. You see, in classical physics, mass had always been associated with some material substance, with some basic stuff out of which everything was made. In modern physics, we recognize that mass is a form of energy. And therefore, particles are not made of any basic stuff, of any basic material substance. Particles are bundles of energy. But energy is always associated with activity, with process. And therefore, particles being bundles of energy are intrinsically dynamic. To understand this better, we must remember that these particles can only be pictured in a framework where space and time are unified into a four-dimensional continuum so that we can no longer make purely static pictures of particles. Any pictures like small billiard balls or small grains of sand or anything are outdated. We cannot picture particles in a purely static space-time uh, way. We have to understand their forms dynamically as forms in space and time. Particles are dynamic patterns, or you could call them patterns of activity, or as I've said, bundles of energy, anything like that. And these patterns have a space aspect and a time aspect. In their space aspect, they appear as objects, and as such, they have a definite mass associated with them, but in their time aspect, they appear as processes, and as such, they involve the equivalent energy. So you have these two pictures to play with, the space picture and the time picture, the mass picture and the energy picture, the object picture and the process picture. 
And these are just two different aspects of one and the same reality, which is a four-dimensional reality, a space-time reality. Now these are not just speculations of a, an abstract theoretical nature, but have very concrete experimental consequences. And perhaps the most spectacular consequence of this space-time world of subatomic physics is the creation and destruction of material particles. This can happen when particles collide with one another with high velocities and therefore with high energies of motion. Uh, in such a collision, it can happen that the energy of motion of the two initial particles is used to create new particles in the collision process and will then appear as the mass or the masses of the newly created particles. So what was energy of motion before is energy of mass after the collision. On the other hand, it can happen that particles are destroyed in these collisions and their energy of mass is transformed into energy of motion and distributed among the other particles participating in the collision. These high energies needed for these collision experiments are achieved in huge machines called particle accelerators and you have the largest of these machines uh, right here in front of our doorstep, so to speak, you know, 20 minutes, I understand, in, uh, from here in Batavia is uh, the biggest particle accelerator that is existing at the moment. It's called the National Acceler Accelerator Laboratory or, or Fermilab. And in these huge machines, this particular one has a circumference of four miles, particles are accelerated around this circular track to enormous velocities coming close to the speed of light and then they are let out and made collide with other particles in a, an arrangement in a chamber called the bubble chamber and the collision, the results are then analyzed. These experimental collisions, these collisions of highly energetic particles are the main experimental tool particle physicists use to study the properties of particles and particle physics is therefore also called high energy physics. This is actually my field of research. I don't do experiments. I'm a theorist, so I just use experimental results. But the results of the experiments are crucial for our research in theoretical subatomic physics. Now, the experimental techniques have, been, have become so sophisticated that they can now not only measure the properties of these particles, they can detect particles that are created in these collisions, measure their properties and analyze them, they can also make the particles leave tracks in the bubble chamber which can be photographed. And I've brought uh, a few slides of these uh, particle tracks that I'd like to show. If we could have the screen again, please, and uh, slides. And you will see that these particle tracks are not only very important for uh, theoretical physics, but also extremely attractive and beautiful. Now this is what is called a bubble chamber. It is a, a chamber which has a liquid in it, mostly liquid hydrogen, and these tracks are tiny bubbles. This is a close-up view, and uh, you will see that the tracks are curved. The curvature is introduced artificially by applying magnetic fields to the chamber and serves for identification purposes, because the nature of a particle, or rather the other way around, the curvature of a track will depend on the nature of the particle and it helps us to identify the particles that has, have caused the tracks. You will also notice a lot of little spirals. These are electrons that are curved by the magnetic field and as they collide with the material in the liquid, they lose energy and then they spiral inward. Now these pictures of particle tracks uh, show us uh, very vividly that matter is dynamic that it is active, that it is, consists of ever-changing dynamic patterns. All particles can be transformed into other particles. They can be created from energy and vanish into energy again. This slide shows a very spectacular collision experiment. On the left side you have a collision between two single protons and uh, about 15 particles are created in the collision. 
The fact that all particles can be transformed into other particles shows us very vividly that the constituents of matter do not exist as isolated entities, but as integral parts of an inseparable network of interactions. These interactions involve a ceaseless flow of energy, a dynamic interplay in which particles are created and destroyed without end in a continual variation of energy patterns. The whole universe is thus engaged in an endless motion and activity in a rhythmic dance of creation and destruction. And here's a very spectacular picture of this rhythmic dance of creation and destruction. Now this idea of rhythm comes sort of naturally into mind when you look at these particles, at these photographs, and to enforce this notion, I'll show you now a few patterns of this dance of creation and destruction of subatomic matter. Now I flashed these across the screen um, on purpose in that way to emphasize movement, rhythm, transformation, change. Now as I've said before, physicists are not the only ones who have been talking about a cosmic dance or a dance of creation of, and destruction, an energy dance. Mystical traditions have used these terms very often and perhaps the most beautiful example is to be found in Hinduism. Hindus have used the image of the dancing god Shiva. According to Hindu belief, all life is a continual change of death and rebirth of creation and destruction. And the dancing god Shiva symbolizes and personifies this change that goes on in endless cycles. I think for the modern physicist, the dance of Shiva is the dance of subatomic matter. As in Hindu mythology, it is a continual dance of creation and destruction involving the whole cosmos. It is the basis of all existence, the basis of all natural phenomena. Hundreds of years ago, Indian artists have created these beautiful statues. I've got another one here, these beautiful bronzes of dancing Shivas. In our time, physicists have used the most advanced technology to create images of the dance of Shiva, which to me are of equal profound significance and equal beauty. And therefore, I've put them both together on the last slide. Here I've got the dance of Shiva, 12th century and 20th century version. And in this metaphor of the cosmic dance, you have a very beautiful unification of ancient mythology religious art and modern science. Thank you very much. The Theosophical Society in America presents Dr. Fritjof Capra, Dr. Mel Melvin, and Dr. Rene Weber in a panel discussion on the Tao of Physics, the relationship between science and the ancient wisdom. Okay. I'm, I was very happy to hear uh, Dr. Weber speak uh, because first when Dr. Melvin spoke I thought well I agree really with everything he says and in fact I've given similar lectures in Berkeley about uh, black holes and red giants and things like this but uh, when she spoke, I, first I disagreed very strongly and then less and less as she went on. And now I think it's a matter of clarification rather than disagreement. But I think the clarification will be very stimulating for all of us. Now, I want to say that, well, this is pretty obvious that you don't have time in a one-hour talk to cover you know, all these aspects of this uh, field and things we are talking about. But I was very careful in my book to write a long chapter on the framework within which I make my comparison. And there I talked about rational knowledge, research, meditation, and most, most of the questions that Dr. Weber raised. Not all of them, but most of them. Now, uh, to begin with, uh, I do emphasize always that science and mysticism are different, that I don't uh, attempt to make a synthesis or anything like that. And um, this is why I composed this symbol of the complementary nature of science and mysticism. 
Uh, one works predominantly in the rational framework, the other predominantly in the intuitive framework. And uh, the methodology is just very different in both cases. Now, I think the point which needs most clarification is that science does not deal with truth. And this is putting it in a stark way, but I think you can put it in that way. Science works in the rational framework, and the rational framework is limited. Whatever we say, all our concepts and theories in science are approximate descriptions of nature. We are not interested, at least if we are good scientists, we should not be interested in the truth. We should be interested in descriptions of phenomena. And uh, all descriptions are approximate. Now this is different from uh, the mystical traditions where apparently truth can be experienced. In fact, maybe you can elaborate on notion of approximation in uh, the Indian tradition, which is a very fascinating subject about various modes of consciousness you know, approximating truth. Now, another point which you pointed out, which with which I agree wholeheartedly, is that there's a difference uh, between science and mysticism insofar as science works on an accumulation of knowledge. As Dr. Weber said, you know, we stand on each other's shoulders. Knowledge is accu accumulated, whereas in the mystical traditions, they rather talk about an emptying of oneself. And in my book, I quote Lao Tzu to that effect, who says that uh, one who seeks knowledge will increase every day, but one who seeks Tao will decrease every day. So this is a, a very fundamental distinction. The mystical insight experiences the essential nature of things, and the scientific method gives you a description of sort of more outward appearances. Now, when I say that the two are complementary, by that I mean that one is not better than the other. One can prefer one over the other, of course, but one shouldn't make a value judgment. Typically, in our society, we have overemphasized the rational, but then we mustn't go to the other extreme and overemphasize the intuitive. Uh, both have its values. I have paraphrased an old Chinese saying to say that scientists know the branches of the Tao and not the roots. Mystics know the roots and not the branches. But if you want to know the whole reality and deal with life successfully, then you, have, you need both. So mystical insight then experiences the essential nature of things, and there it's characteristic of this experience that the ultimate reality is experienced as being conscious in a very profound personal way. And at that level, I think, when you experience reality as being conscious, at that level, wisdom and moral values arise. And Dr. Weber said that the knower herself remains outside of science, which is true to a large extent. But recently, there has been some change in quantum theory and in more recent developments. Physicists are now beginning to talk about consciousness. And if you study quantum theory carefully, then you have to realize that there cannot be a complete theoretical description of the atomic reality without mentioning consciousness. However, we can do quantum theory pragmatically uh, without mentioning consciousness. So consciousness is very new in physics. Physicists are just now beginning to talk about it. And I think that uh, moral values may arise and we may come to the point to deal with wisdom and moral values if this research and investigation of consciousness in the framework of physics expands. And there are people who, uh, who think like that. Uh, I was going to mention David Bohm, and then Rene Weber mentioned him herself. But uh, the last point I want to make is that moral values may or may not be addressed in physics in the future. And I don't really care which way it goes. I think it's not important. Because I think that these approaches are complementary approaches. And we have to address moral values as human beings. But which way we do it doesn't matter. Which approach we use to reality and to uh, recognizing our role in the universe and so on uh, doesn't matter to me. I can use intuitive approaches and I can use rational approaches. And I do whatever works best in, in the given situation. And rational knowledge, science, physics, may lead up 
to a point and can lead up to a point where you then make contact with uh, a mystical type of awareness and you then realize that there are these uh, other values, that there is this wisdom, this uh, sense of unity with the cosmos and so on. And this is why I think that physics can be a way to enlightenment and self-realization. This is why I've called my book The Tao of Physics, which is the way of physics, the way to spiritual knowledge and self-realization. I think that mystical insight does not depend on the chosen path. There are many traditional paths in the various mystical traditions, and I think physics too can be such a path. And whether or not the intuitive insights and the wisdom and the moral values are reached at through what we now call the scientific framework, or whether you go out of the scientific framework to do it, to me is not important because I'm a human being before being a physicist, and the physicist is just a, a specialization. And I should mention that Krishnamurti helped me a lot in, in gaining this insight. In the, about 10 years ago when I met him, I had this problem in a very direct way, and I asked him, how can I do science? You know, with all you say about getting out of thought and freedom from the known and all that. And he said, well, you're first of all a human being, and then you are a scientist. And I think in this way one can do, one can combine both. All right, that's, I think, all I wanted to say. Well, the ten minutes pass very quickly, so uh, <laughs> perhaps uh, I will not get to say everything that uh, I wanted to. First, we were told that we are not good. Uh, and uh, I, uh, I didn't mind that so much. <laughs> I didn't mind that so much because it was not news to me. But we were beautiful. We were told, <laughs> we were told that, <laughs> and we were told that we are, we were beautiful and true. And now uh, Dr. Capra says we are not true either. <laughs> And I have my doubts about myself being beautiful. <laughs> uh, however, um, I think the one thing that I would like to say first is to dispel uh, some differences of language. When uh, Plato or René refers to uh, the good, uh, I, I would rather think of love, because obviously that's the, the third element uh, that most of us uh, would, would want to find in, uh, in a highly enlightened consciousness. Consciousness becoming more uh, more aware than ever. Um, I don't really. Well, let me address myself to uh, first to some rather superficial things. Uh, this business, this general talk about moral values, uh, is a little bit uh, abstract. You see, uh, what is what is moral? What is moral? What is good? That's the main thing I would like to talk about. First, on on a superficial level. I think that some of the activities that the scientist engages in, like some of the activities that the housewife engages in, like some of the activities that you can put any number of other names on that engages in, are highly moral and highly spiritual. The, I have a reverence for the most ordinary things in life sometimes, and particularly for the non-ulterior. Ever since I was a boy, it seemed to me that uh, holiness is related to non-ulterior behavior behavior that isn't motivated by some gain, by some practical gain. And I discovered later that that's in all the scriptures, you know, that that's exactly what they say. So to me, uh, the moral values are involved in, in doing something for its own sake and for the sake of, without, without gaining from it personally. And this is the, a great theosophical teaching too, I believe. Uh, uh, that uh, you know, you work as if you are ambitious, but uh, but kill out all ambition is what uh, HPB said, uh, Madame Madame Blavatsky, and uh, other people have said similar things. It's you do not work for the fruits, but uh, for for the thing itself. Uh, this moral transformations like that have happened in the history of science. Galileo started out as a rather grasping, egocentric fellow, ended up as a rather good scientist. You know, Einstein started out uh, blessedly without that, and he ended up the same way. Um, it doesn't really uh, bother me too much about that part of it. I do hate nuclear bombs, and I, as, as more than anybody else in this audience probably, it has shadowed my life 
uh, badly. It has made me much less of a good physicist than I might have been. But uh, that, those are all really minor things compared to the issue we're discussing today. I say even the nuclear destruction of mankind, as it is now, is a minor thing compared to what we're talking about today. The real goal of realization and illumination and awakening, whatever you want to call it, as every expert in the field has made clear, by experts I mean Christ, Buddha, Shankara, people like that, who are obviously mystic boys and who know their business, they've made it clear over and over again that the highest good is awakening, realization. It doesn't matter if you die of cancer, it doesn't matter what happens to you, if you're not awakened, you're unlucky. If you're awakened, you're, 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 in, in, you're in it. It. That's it. There isn't anything else. I've even heard Krishnamurti, whom we, several of us, like very much, uh, say that you've got heaven by the tail. He said that pri more or less privately. He doesn't say such things publicly. <laughs> but that is the goal. So if I could do that for you, what higher good could I do for you? I mean, that, that's it. And I think that's, from that stems a great neutrality with regard to ordinary goods. Ordinary goods. In other words, even healing, which is a fine thing to do, even uh, reassuring people, supporting them. That's all supportive therapy. The only really important thing is realization, is awakening. And so in that, in that sense, I don't think there's any difference between uh, the ultimate development of science, uh, because it's just one more way of yoga. It's very much related to jnana yoga. And um, it, it, it provides science, or particularly, let's say, pure mathematics, the mathematical forms of science, provides a form. Without substance, it's no use. Without substance, it, it, it's in, it, that's true in every realm that you have, have truth. And I do believe in truth. I don't believe in the truth with a big capital T. I believe in lots of levels of truth because I've seen it happen that you go from one level to another. But that there is truth, I certainly believe. I don't think life is endurable without that conception. Well, that, that's a big thing to say. I uh, Perhaps I shouldn't have been so fervent about that point. But anyway, uh, I, I don't know. Maybe I'll have a little more to say about that later. Let me just tell you a little story now because... Uh, uh, I, uh, I promised I would. It's, uh, it's a nice in example of how one proceeds to more and more subtle things in the development of any, anything, science or, or uh, yoga. Uh, the Hindus have a tradition, this is for going from the gross to the subtle, they have a tradition of showing, uh, where the groom shows the bride uh, that process. He actually shows her how to go from the gross to the subtle. This is obviously part of the uh, initiation rites of marriage. And what, the, what he does is he shows her the Big Dipper in the sky, which is, of course, very obvious. And the goal is for her to see a little star which was called Arundhati in, uh, in Sanskrit. And it is a star that is known in the West as Alcor, I find. Alcor is just barely visible. It used to be a test of visual acuity. And if you look in the handle of the Big Dipper, you know, the Big Dipper is what enables you to find the North Pole star, you find this little star, Alcor, uh, which is just near another star called Mizar. Mizar is easy to see, Alcor is not. And when she finally sees Alcor, he has shown her how you go from the gross to the subtle, you see. And this is, uh, of course, symbolic of the whole process of awakening desire in the bride and so on. And I think this symbolizes what happens in, in all these searches, that one proceeds from rather obvious things and, and uh, you know, in which truth has some simple meaning to more and more subtle levels. And what is important is to realize that, to me, this, this was uh, Dr. Kapras told, Kapras told you of a personal uh, release that he had, I think to me it was a very important realization that the truth on one level of consciousness is not the same as on another, but that you must not violate the truth of the previous level of consciousness, you, you, because then you're just a liar. And the, the first, uh, almost the first axiom of Patanjali, the great yoga uh, teacher, was that you must be honest, you must tell the truth, you must not even by inference can tell lies. And I think uh, that is a point that I, I, I want to make, that, that we all aim for that, for that 
truth, and that in the end that's going to lead us to very strange places, like the place I mentioned earlier, namely that the highest good that I can do for you is not to heal you and not to, uh, to support you in your uh, weakness and so on. It may be that you should, you should suffer. It may be that you should suffer. I don't believe in suffering as a value in itself, but it may be that you should if it brings you enlightenment, if you realize enlightenment. And what is enlightenment? It may be just that you no longer do anything uh, with, uh, with a grip, you see. Uh, there's the heroism of the relaxed grip. And that's what I don't like about morality, per se, uh, explicitly spoken. You know, you must be moral, and that's sort of, there's a grip about it. So I think there's the goodness, the basic goodness is in the relaxed grip. And it's a kind of neutrality. Our friend Dr. Merrill Wolf speaks of the high indifference that results from a certain level of consciousness. There's no longer a concern uh, for going one way or going another. And yet it's those very people who experience this high indifference and that's, that's a, that may be an indifference even, as I say, to the annihilation of this physical species. But the people who experience that indifference are the very same people who have taken the Kuan Yin vow. And the Kuan Yin vow is the most uh, majestic, magnificent vow that I know of in, in human experience. It's the vow of the bodhisattvas, the vow of the people who are on the threshold of realization, who know what it's like to have total peace, total serenity that passes all understanding, who, 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 who could be through with this, this whole business, you know, living in this bad neighborhood that we all live in, and who turn back, and who take the vow that they will not leave, they will not go from here, escape from their little personal, tra uh, you know, straitjacket that we're, each of us has, until everyone else, every other being in the universe is released. Well, that Kuan Yin vow shows you what goodness really means. But as I say, it's no uh, no goody-goody goodness, you know, no, no, no small potatoes goodness. It's the only goodness that really counts, the awakening of consciousness. That's all I have to say. about young and old and fervent and not fervent before. <laughs> <laughs> Our ages are relative. Yeah. <laughs> Looks like it. Well, I suppose I must rise here to the defense of the third member of the triad, the good. First of all, I would, I would like to assure everybody that from the perspective from which I look at this matter, it's not the case that we are not good. I think that kind of perspective on the matter is really too anthropomorphic in a certain sense. And the notion of the good, as I've been using it, uh, as Plato uses it, or the notion of sat in the Hindu framework, doesn't, certainly, I agree fully with Mel here, doesn't uh, cut the universe down to the size of a brownie scout. And so the notion of uh, goody-goody kind of virtue, I think, does not enter the issue at all. Uh, what then can one mean by this concept of good for which I, quite frankly, still hold out? And I think perhaps a synonym might be the sacred or the holy. Now, as that term has been used in mystical literature, it's quite non-judgmental. It is not accorded only to uh, people or phenomena that meet with the approval of the person who makes the judgment, but rather it's always been considered to be analogous to, and that's been used throughout mystical literature, to the sun, to some tremendous source of light or illumination. That's always a recurrent metaphor, the notion of light or sun, that simply sheds itself indiscriminately, you might say, on anything that is by its sheer nature, by its sheer force. It cannot help but do so. In a sense, very like the bodhisattva figure whom Mel invoked a little while ago. 
Now, from that perspective, for example, even someone like Plato, who talks about the good as being the binding power that holds the frame of the universe together, without which nothing could be, and certainly nothing could be known, that kind of concept doesn't refer so much to a property, to a value judgment, as to a force. And perhaps later, after the Greek era, in the Christian era, all that happened was that an O dropped out of the good and it became known as God. And for Plato, as a matter of fact, this kind of force is so overwhelming that he cautions people to prepare themselves very carefully before they would tackle the path towards union with the good, because it is not something neutral or even um, namby-pamby or weak, but it's ra rather overwhelming for the unprepared. I think Patanjali does the same in the yoga system uh, in first carefully laying down steps having to do with conduct before people tackle higher states of consciousness. So. We are, it's not the case that we're not good. It's obvious that this force, whatever, by whatever term one wishes to name it, is a cosmic force. And the question is simply, how do we, who also are the cosmos, contact it in our daily lives? And so, in a sense, the question now, I would say, shifts slightly from the theoretical towards the practical. Now, Dr. Copper has said, it doesn't really matter which path we use in the future, the rational or perhaps some other, the mystical path. These are complementary, so long as the meaning that the Tao and physics um, speak of emerges somehow. Why should it matter whether these two are integrated or whether they're pursued in a complementary way? I can very fully appreciate the desirability in one way of separating these. On the other hand, I have some concern about their separation. And these are not merely theoretical or intellectual, but they are practical and, if you will, moral. I think in the first place, in my own field, there has been, in philosophy, there has been a complete divorcement. And I would say a consequent schizophrenia in philosophy from the time of Descartes, but perhaps more recently in the 18th century, from the time of Kant, so that after that period, the is and the ought, fact on the one hand, value on the other, have been irreconcilably separated, and there has been no way to get them back together. What this has done, I think, even in the, in the age of uh, atomic physics, this whole new revolutionary physics and particle physics and um, relativity physics of which uh, Dr. Capra and Dr. Melwin have been speaking, even in that age, there has been not even the slightest hint as to how these divergences might ever be brought back together again. What difference then does that make, one might say? How could it, why should it not remain separated as long as the truth somehow gets out? I think the differences are manifold, but let me reduce them to two. First of all, I think we don't live in a vacuum. We live in a social context. In our social context, it so happens that science and the queen of the sciences, the root of the sciences, namely physics, um, is respected, is taken seriously as perhaps the dominant philosophy of our day. Therefore, what scientists, what physicists hold about the universe, I think, matters greatly if uh, the rest of humanity is ever to have hope of guiding their lives by something that isn't just a matter of taste, social consensus, uh, poll taking, or personal preference, relativity in ethics. In other words, the ancient dream in both Hinduism and Buddhism, and certainly in, in the Greeks and Plato, of fusing what we know with what we are of fusing the truth about the world in which we live with the conduct 
of our interrelationship in our lives, that dream has been lost, and I would like very much to see it revived. So I think, on the one hand, if physicists would use their professional lives, their knowledge, to even hold out a hint of such a hope, it would be very helpful to all of us. I think, secondly, and as a matter of fact, I might just add here as a postscript, some few physicists seem to me to be pulling in that direction. David Bohm, who, of whom we've spoken, is one of them. Um, I think, secondly, it matters not just from the point of view of uh, the practical, but now from the point of view of, of the theory, of theory, of the theoretical. If it's the case, and here I'm going to extrapolate, if everything that physics has told us is so uncannily parallel to what ancient metaphysics has been saying, then one would be encouraged to believe by a process of extrapolation that other doctrines of ancient metaphysics, not yet verified in any way by physics, will also turn out one day to become verified. And so, just to use, I jump both feet now, into Hinduism. Uh, in Hindu uh, cosmology, there are allowances made for the kinds of fields. I'm not saying that they're well elaborated or well described, but one can map them onto that. For the kinds of fields about which physics today is speaking, gravitational field, electromagnetic field, something having to do with light, radiation, and so on. Um, perhaps even something having to do with particles, this precipitation of Brahman of itself into specific delineable particles. However, a field of which Hindu metaphysics speaks as the highest field experienceable by a human being, namely something called a bliss field. Brahman is bliss accessible, at least in principle, to all human beings, and who the contact with which changes drastically our lives, our interactions, our compassion for one another. That kind of even direction has in no way yet, I think, been tapped by the best the frontiers of modern knowledge. And what I've been suggesting is that it would be extraordinary if even the most tentative steps in that direction could be taken by those working at the frontiers, I think, of scientific knowledge, and that's, those are the physicists, the astrophysicists, and the cosmologists. <laughs> well, I think I agree, you know, very much with uh, much what you say. In fact, I often uh, say in my lectures exactly what you said about uh, the the fact that physics seems to be closely related to mysticism and therefore that the other uh, teachings of the mystics uh, maybe are not wrong either. And uh, I often say that uh, physicists are not yet listening to the mystics, but they will, because nothing impresses a scientist more than success. And if he, she, if he or she can no longer do research uh, successfully and efficiently without taking these wider views into account, they, they will just study these views. Mm -hmm. And also I agree very much w with what you say about the social dimension of physics. In fact, I end my book by saying that I believe that the present social uh, system in which we live is incompatible with the results of modern physics and that we need a cultural revolution in the true sense of the word. And I'm writing a second book about this topic, so I'm going to expand on it. But it'll be slow, it won't be come. But there are these movements that I mentioned in the beginning of my talk today. Uh, the, you know, these holistic <coughs> movements, the mystical, and uh, I think it's, it's, it's not a coincidence that you are making these remarks as a tenured member of the establishment, but also as a woman. You know? And I think that, that women will really uh, change things tremendously, because so far, you know, politically speaking, we are just misrepresented, because only half of us is represented by the uh, you know, people in power. And once the other half gets represented properly, it, it'll just change. The, you know, the shift towards the balance between yin and yang will just 
be brought about by that. I mean, imagine the, the head of the Pentagon being a woman and the head of the CIA being a woman, and you know, and I don't mean Indira Gandhi type women, I mean, you know, real, real women, because these are a stage we have to go through, but uh, it'll just change tremendously. So I really see these changes you are talking about mm -hmm. coming. It's just sort of a groundswell. It's and, very uh, slow. Yeah. May I just, uh, what would fit very well with that, I didn't have the time, uh, uh, Feynman who is at Caltech and at whom we talked earlier, certainly a theoretical and very imaginative physicist. He is the first person to have given any indication, to my knowledge, of the direction uh, which I am uh, arguing for. He wrote in his lectures on physics, uh, which he gave out in uh, California, quote, the next great era of awakening of human intellect may well produce a method of understanding the qualitative content of equations. Today we cannot see whether Schrodinger's equations contains frogs, musical composers, or morality, or whether it does not. We cannot see, say whether something beyond it, like God, is needed or not, and so we can all hold strong opinions either way." Unquote. Now he's the first person, to my knowledge, who dared to venture quite some time ago uh, the notion that the future of physics may not lie only in the quantitative, but that indeed the revolution would come by tackling the qualitative, the value dimension of even so value-free a domain as physics. And I don't know if you think this is a very general trend or not. No, certainly not. But there are, have been other people who are said things like that, but it's it's not expanded, it's, it's true. Yeah. Speaking of uh, women um, and uh, truth and changing the truths of, of men, uh, I must tell you this story about, uh, uh, which refers to uh, Dr. Kupra's remark that science doesn't deal with truth, with which I do not agree, as I made clear. Uh, it is true and it, that people say, uh, everybody, in fact it's a fashion, fashionable thing and even to some extent a reasonable thing to say that science, that means exact sciences, are uh, based on uh, making models rather than dealing with reality, even making models of reality. The map is not the territory and so on. Uh, and uh, the story I want to tell you is that of the woman who was told that she had a model husband and she said rather bitterly, if you look in the dictionary, the definition of a model is a small imitation of the real thing. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what women are going to do to us as soon as they become heads of the Pentagon and the CIA. <laughs> They're going to make all our constructs uh, small imitations of the real thing. Well, I don't really uh, believe that. I think women are human beings just like men and that, in fact, I've never, I've never understood how anybody could think otherwise since the genes are always being split in two and, uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's almost inc insane to think otherwise that, uh, that, and it certainly does uh, divide, it, it, what's the equivalent of amputating in half the whole human race. So that, that's, uh, beside the point. Now, as to what's happening in the world today, I, uh, I suppose it's not the first time, and nor the last time, that people are discovering that the most important thing in their lives, and the central thing, the first thing they know, and the last thing they know, first thing they know when they come in, and the last thing they know when they go out, is their own consciousness. So, I mean, whenever I hear that so-and-so is the first to say something, uh, or this is news, uh, I'm always very surprised because it's been around for a long, long time, uh, ever since the consciousness was here, and for all we know, that's always. And uh, so uh, that, uh, that's, not a, that's not a new problem. However, I th again, I, I cannot help but hammer away at the first and foremost problem, which is uh, to make the consciousness more alive, which is what it's all about. And that often has a very simple meaning. I mean, the, all these, uh, Dr. Capra has these nice quotations, which are great classics in the field, you know, of what does, what does it mean to, uh, to be realized, to be illuminated? 
Well, it all, ends, it all adds up to the fact that every one of us is realized, but we don't know it, you see. Uh, we, don't, we haven't realized that we are realized. Because, for example, one great Zen master says, uh, when he's asked, uh, what is Zen? He says, eat when hungry, sleep when tired. Something like that, you know. I mean, it's back to the simple things of life. But without the great involvement, without the confusion, the complications that uh, we have created. Uh, so I'm not so sure that the answer is going to consist of uh, uh, more and more intricate equations and uh, analyses. And uh, I, I must say that I, uh, to speak frankly, uh, that very same uh, Dick Feynman that uh, you invoked is a mechanist. And uh, he, he, he cannot understand at all. He actually went out and tried, but he cannot understand at all the, the movement that's going on among people today of, uh, you know, seeking for subtler things, uh, experiencing uh, the chakras and so on. That, that's utterly meaningless to him, you know. He, 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 he tried it and failed. The fact that he doesn't see something or know something means it doesn't exist. So it isn't enough to be extremely uh, bright and clever and to uh, be open-minded about what physics can do and so on and so forth. I think the problem is, is quite a different one. It's, the problem is one of direct experience. And that's, uh, that's where we, we have to emphasize it, I think. The, uh, I, I agree with the analysis that truth in, in, on any, in any field consists of both form and substance. There's a form and there's a substance. There's the baby in the basket, right? And without, and it's true that logic in, uh, is, 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 a, is a basket. It's not the baby itself. And on the empirical level, logic works as a basket. Uh, the baby is the perception, the direct perception, uh, what you actually experience. Uh, the basket is the logical analysis of it. So that's perception and conception. The same is true, and it seems to me, uh, in the mystical experience, there any amount of theory about it, talking about it, which we're doing right now, we're, we're violating the very principle that I am expressing. And in fact, every time we discuss these things, we're probably uh, ruining our spiritual development. <laughs> <laughs> First by being photographed, and, and all this superstar business is horrible. I mean, what is worse for the little ego than to be fed this way? It, it's bad for it, you know. It's like overeating. And uh, it's certainly... Well, you know, the same, uh, but, but, would Buddha have made it if he had had lights like this shining on him <laughs> under the Bodhi tree? He certainly wouldn't have. I mean, <laughs> He would have postponed his realization. <laughs> so, I mean, really, this, uh, the, the point is that there has to be direct experience. And I don't think, and I, physics and is just like mathematics. It's a basket. Uh, and uh, you don't want to, it's true that you, you want the baby rather than the basket. The, ba the baby is what really counts. But ba baskets are important. The babies, uh, it's not practical to handle babies without baskets. It's not practical, it's also not kind, and so on. So we need these forms of logic and uh, of physics and science and so on and so forth. But I, I would emphasize over and over again that the real, the point of the matter is the, is the experience itself, the uh, experience of introception, of awakened consciousness, and so on. And the other things are all secondary. And with that, and there's one other remark, and perhaps I've talked too much, but one other remark that uh, when I said the relaxed grip, I had something in mind, namely that when you aim for something very directly, uh, you usually miss the mark. Uh, you, you aim for... And Napoleon always claimed that he was really trying to unify mankind, you know, and so on. So I, I think that the, the truly authentic yogic attitude, which is a relaxed one, uh, the attitude of a great physician, which is that he doesn't really invest too much in, in curing the patient. He tries in a detached way to cure the patient, but he doesn't make it a terrible ego investment. That that is more likely to produce a good world, so-called, than, than the attitude which goes after good worlds.
you see. And I think that fits in with the mystic tradition. The attitude that goes after good worlds, makes more laws, more laws, more laws, seems to somehow be self-defeating. Our seeking for a higher standard of living, you know, you see what it has brought us. We're comfortable and, indi and we suffer from indigestion and so on and so forth. And uh, so I, I really uh, believe once again that the direct experience and not uh, making an issue of, uh, of mor moralism but will lead to a spontaneous uh, morality that is much more likely to be successful because all the moral codes in the world up till now have not been successful. In all matter concentration. There, uh, there is a very remarkable symmetry between matter and antimatter that uh, for every process involving particles there is an equivalent process involving antiparticles with, that will occur with the same probability. However, our part of the universe is made overwhelmingly of matter. So that has led to this question which was very well put. Uh, the world expert on this question is a physicist by the name of Al Fain, who has written a little book called Worlds, Anti-Worlds. Who asked the question? Can I? Uh, uh, yeah, it's called Worlds, Anti-Worlds, and Al Fain is spelled A-L-F-V-E-N. And I have the exact reference in the bibliography of my book. And uh, he says in that book that uh, it's not known that cosmologists, and maybe you can comment on this on the present situation because this is, the book is about 10 years old. Cosmologists do not know whether uh, there are whole galaxies of antimatter, where, whether half of a galaxy is antimatter. We don't know where it is, or they don't know where it is. What they know for sure is that our solar system consists all of matter. Maybe you could just take yes, on from yes, there. Yes, uh, this is more within my province. The, um, the situation is that uh, there is no good evidence of large quantities of antimatter in the universe. Uh, there is only this general principle that there ought to be uh, as much antimatter as matter, if nothing else matters. I mean, uh, <laughs> there is a strange asymmetry. That's one of about seven overall properties of the universe that I listed in a report I just prepared. I sent out a paper just before I came here. That's why I didn't sleep for several nights, and, and I'm, so, I'm very fervent, as you notice. Uh, the, uh, the point is that uh, uh, we ha the, uh, the reason we do not think there's any antimatter in the vicinity of our galaxy, in the neighboring galaxy the either, is that if there were, there would have been a lot of annihilation radiation. You see, whenever a particle of matter meets a particle of antimatter, uh, they annihilate. Uh, with the, uh, particularly if it's, a, if it's a simple kind of matter and antimatter like electrons and positrons, which are anti-electrons, they annihilate into light, just radiation. So a total conversion of the mass into radiative energy. Now we know that that is not happening in anything like the amount that it would happen if there were if there was antimatter around. So if there uh, is antimatter in the universe, it exists in separate superclusters, probably, you see. It would have to be a supercluster away, which as you know, I showed you about the order of a hundred million light years away to the next one. And there might be cells of matter and antimatter. Just recently, just within the last few weeks, uh, several scientists have suggested a way of possibly detecting uh, such antimatter by the, uh, the photons, the light quanta that come from them. It turns out that in the nuclear processes which go on in stars, which lead to the energy that we all experience, you know, our sun's energy too, uh, there, are, there are certain types of interactions known as weak interactions, one of the four fundamental interactions. In the weak interactions, the symmetry between right and left breaks down a little bit, and likewise the symmetry between uh, antimatter and matter is broken, just to balance each other, so that it turns out matter is left-handed and antimatter is right-handed in these weak interactions. And so the handedness of antimatter would show up in, in the electrons coming out of these weak interactions in antimatter, and that they, they would be transmitted, handed on to the photons. Electrons create photons in certain ways. And we would observe those photons um, 100 million light years later, 100 million years later, you see. And we would see uh, from the handedness of the photon, we would be able to tell that it was an antimatter source rather than a matter source. So there is some possibility, actually uh, most likely with, with supernova observed, 
at, and it would be very hard to observe them at such distances, uh, that, that maybe there, there is as much antimatter as matter in the universe. You realize you're getting the hottest new results, just a few weeks old. Yes. Um, I must tell you a limerick, too, uh, on this. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it goes like this. You see, sometimes this antimatter is called contraterrene, because matter is terrene. This is terrene, of uh, the terra, of the earth, contraterrene. So the limerick, which I learned many years ago, goes like this. There was a young spaceman named Gene, who ventured forth nevermore to be seen. Out in space, he essayed the embrace of a girl who was contra terrene. <laughs> and you see, that was a real shotgun wedding. If antimatter is existing in large quantities, it would be moving backwards in time where probably we wouldn't be able to detect it. No, maybe I can answer that. Yeah. I'm afraid uh, that's an example of taking uh, an as if, as if it were substantial. Metaphors, you know, are only as ifs. Uh, antimatter, as antimatter, behaves like any, uh, uh, and like matter, it goes forward in time. It's only there's an as if there that if you want to, you can describe it as matter going backward in time for certain purposes. I'm afraid Dr. Capra. Uh, well, he will explain further. He only meant that. Uh, yeah, no, by, by I was just saying there was a slight confusion that antiparticles can be interpreted as particles moving backward in time. So antimatter could be interpreted as matter moving backward. But as antimatter, as uh, you said, it moves always forward. So there's yeah. no, no problem. And it's not quite sure how, uh, no. how basic one should take those interpretations. Right. They're based on a, right. just on a certain model, a very small imitation of reality. <laughs> but by the way, I do want to say one thing that's relevant, I think, that to you, uh, you did not say in your book. And in fact, I've never seen anybody say it. If you want contributions of physics to, uh, to God, who needs it like hole a hole in my head. Well, uh, I don't uh, mention you, God in my no. head. You, 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 I mean, if you want it, there's a very interesting fact about this same type of theory, which is quantum field theory and perturbation theory, that is really very striking. That is, if you take one of those electrons or positrons, the particles moving along in space, they're continually creating and destroying <coughs> photons in a certain sense, what we, uh, you know, uh, uh, virtual photons. Uh, which uh, Dr. Kupra indicates very nicely in his talking about, in the book, and talking about things that are, in a sense, neither exist nor don't exist, or both exist and don't exist. You, there's a, they're called virtual particles. Uh, so f there's a continual cloud of, of potential and half-existing half photons <laughs> accompanying every electron. That means, and you are made of many, many electrons, many, many, as you've got, you know, that, just imagine yourself full of cherries, uh, <laughs> and the cherries the size of Jupiter or something. I mean, the, the, yourself is the size of Jupiter. And uh, well, anyway, uh, electron, each electron in you is accompanied by these uh, this immense cloud of, of uh, virtual photons. Photons travel with the speed of light. Photons cross the universe in zero time. They're present all over the universe at once. They have no, there's no time for the, between the beginning and the end of a photon. And for them, the universe has simply collapsed into a thin shadow, a uh, you know, two-dimensional shadow as far as concerned, because the, the distance contract to zero for a photon, the distance from here to the end of the universe is zero, and the time it takes to go that distance is zero. So you are made up of omniscience, little entities that are little gods. I mean, they're like God. They're omniscient. They're and I'm, I'm, they're omnipresent all over the universe. That is a, a direct uh, transcription into uh, extremely unreliable language of uh, <laughs> of what uh, what the perturbation theory and quantum field theory says. Can we get into that a little more deeply tomorrow? I think it's mostly there. And it might be the hour. I'm not sure. But, uh, <laughs> I'd like to try that at ten o'clock tomorrow morning. Keep the contradict something. You're there too. <laughs> Um, the second question was, uh, again, directed to uh, Dr. Caper. In your quark uh, symmetry, do you indicate a morphology or form structure in the ever-expanding universe? I don't understand the question. Could you elaborate, whoever asked it, on what you mean by that? Question here. Uh, is the expanding universe 
uh, following the quark theories? Does it form a definite pattern? Uh, I don't think there's any relation at this point. Well, I don't believe in the quark theories in the first place, but uh, even those people who do don't see any relation between quark models and and cosmology. As far as I know, I don't think there's... Since the building blocks are discounted, I thought perhaps that there would be some forces that would lead to a unified and a... Uh, Oh, a definite pattern like... Well, maybe, you know, this, this maybe will emerge one day, but th we are quite far from that point still, so nobody even thinks about that yet. Thank you. We're only important in the early phases. Yes, yes. It was very small. A uh, long one. Dr. Capra, now that they care to come to our new modern physics perception of the reality of the universe. No, I think I've partly uh, referred to that before when I said that consciousness has come into physics very recently and we don't have much to say about it. And I didn't mean to say that these poles exhaust uh, human nature and patterns of human activity. In fact, the Chinese themselves um, have combined the yin and the yang first into pairs of two and then into triplets and then into what are, what are called hexagrams. And in the book of changes or I Ching, they have a whole uh, cosmology, a whole map of uh, cosmic and human situations that are brought about by the interplay between the yin and the yang in various combinations. So I don't mean to imply that just the two poles exhaust uh, all possibilities. But nevertheless, we can't help uh, noticing that these two poles exist and, and play a certain role. Again, this is a model, and, but I think it's a very useful one. It's certainly more useful because it's more general than this left brain, right brain stuff, which is really uh, rigid and quite primitive, but which is also useful in a, in a first approximation. Well, one thing I would have liked to hear a physicist discuss is this question that I think Bohm has raised. Is it true that until now, I mean, you say, of course, consciousness has come late into physics, and I think the way it's come into physics is mostly in the form of questioning as to what role it might play in the observing process. Mm -hmm. But that's a fairly epistemological level of treating the question. Now, I think what Bohm is talking about is quite different. Namely, would it be, would it give us something new in physics to deal with the energy of consciousness and not the energy of matter? And do you recognize the legitimacy of this distinction? Well. I can tell you about, I've got my recent developments too. These are about, uh, well, about two or three months old. And uh, I think I talked to you about before that over, over dinner that there are very exciting developments in S matrix theory, in, in the field of physics where I work, uh, that uh, I don't know how, f how much I, I should go into details. Let me just say that they have brought the notion of order to the forefront of particle physics. That uh, the notion that those processes, those interactions be between particles, and we're talking only about strongly interacting particles here, about hadrons. Those interactions between hadrons, which are the most ordered in a certain sense, which we can well define, those interactions and processes are the most likely to happen. For those, the probability is the strongest. So in the first approximation, we consider the most ordered ones. And then we introduce this order in successive steps. Now, this is going to be, I think, a very crucial notion in all of strong interaction physics, which is just coming out now. And Chu is writing a major paper on it, which uh, he has just about finished now, but it's not yet published. And uh, I think that this will have profound uh, consequences for what you're talking about. Because if you think about what order is, then it really is a pattern of consciousness. It really is a pattern of, of cognition or of perception. So again, 
this would confirm what I've already indicated in the book, that what we see depends on how we look at it, that patterns of mind, of matter, are reflections of patterns of mind. Now, Bohm approaches this subject from another angle. He talks about time. He talks about the notion of time, which uh, is very problematic at the subatomic level. We have to abandon the notion of linear flowing time very often. And he attacks the question of time from the psychological level, influenced by Krishnamurti. And uh, he tries to construct or to explore a certain substructure which underlies the classical notion of smoothly flowing time and sees this substructure of time also as a re reflection of patterns of consciousness. In fact, he gave a talk in Berkeley about half a year ago, and I asked him the question explicitly whether he saw patterns of matter as reflections of patterns of consciousness. And he said, yes, that's exactly what I'm talking about. So it's the same result, but seen from a different angle. And I think S-matrix theory will back this up. So I think we're in for exciting results in the next few years. Thank you. I think uh, maybe one thing might be said about that. Uh, S-matrix theory is no doubt uh, well known to all of you, <laughs> but uh, uh, it does, it does uh, it, it is a highly streamlined uh, kind of theory in contrast with the quantum field theory. It amputates certain aspects of quantum field theory. So, for example, no, it does not, does not, around. well, I, I would say no. <laughs> okay. Uh, you're, that's a matter yes. of opinion. But I think it leaves out certain elements of the quantum field theory. So, for example, the description in space and time is not uh, given. Uh, it just talks about things way out at the beginning and way out at the end. But uh, the point is that by not, by not introducing space and time, I'm really giving you a little, uh, a little boost. Uh, in, in by not introducing it in the structure, it's, it's sort of open as to how you're going to interpret uh, the ordinary passage of time. And I think one thing that may not have been mentioned, uh, and is not very generally thought about, I believe, is that may, we may someday find that we want to replace the usual conception of time by even more radical interpretations than, than when Newton's view was given up, and in which, for example, we replace it by uh, some, struct some formal formalism from information theory. Bits of information put together in a certain way would make up uh, what we call time. Well, that's what Bohm is talking about. Is know? it? Yeah, I haven't, very much. I haven't seen it. Yeah, he introduces a certain algebra and, and topology and... Oh, um, I see. Well, then he's, on, he's on the right track. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Just again for Dr. Uh, Caper, it's... Uh, you mentioned the works of Carlos Castaneda, more than 100 books. Do you see his uh, books as perhaps another interpretation of an ultimate reality, or what? How do you feel about uh, Don Juan's speech? Yeah, Castaneda has helped me a lot with his books because he describes a mystical tradition which is very much related to the other better known traditions, but uses very different terms. And so it helped me to sort of check on, on things I, I read in Buddhism, Hinduism, or Taoism, especially in Taoism, and using these different terms. And the teachings are, I find extremely imaginative, and some of the concepts are original and of a kind that I've never read anywhere else and that have inspired me a lot. Like, for instance, the concept of controlled folly, which is the most sensible answer to the question of you know, morality versus cosmic consciousness that I have found. Don Juan says, that I know that whatever I do, whenever I strive in my everyday life after the good and after being happy and so on, and so on, that from the cosmic point of view, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter which way I go. However, from the human point of view, I have to live at that level. So although I know that it is folly, I accept it. And in this way, I control my folly. And this, this is how he introduces the term of controlled folly. I, th I think that's just a very beautiful formulation and you know, very imaginative. Yeah, I, th I think that's very high wisdom, just what he, he said. Um, I, I am uh, fond of those books, too. Uh, you might say uh, 
but I do want to express a little warning that it's better if you haven't read them to start with the second book and not the first because even the third, I think, or even the third, right? They get, to they get better really as they profound. as they go along. There That's are four right. books altogether, and it's because evidently Carlos Castaneda did not understand what was going on at all at the That's beginning. Right. In fact, right at the beginning, when I read the first book, I thought, now. Um, Don Juan is smarter than Socrates, but Carlos is a lot dumber than Plato. <laughs> <laughs> because, it, because it starts out with all this the business of psychedelic drugs and so on, you get the impression that that's what it's about. And it, it isn't at all, as, as Juan makes very clear as he goes along. He, he only used these, he said they're very bad for, for the nervous system, but uh, you are so stupid that I had to use them. And, uh, but he does say very many beautiful things. And one example of what uh, Fritjof Kapra was saying just now is that uh, he says them in colloquial language, you see. So you see, you hear the same things. If you hear them from Krishnamurti, uh, you know, this, uh, this enormous uh, dithyram about seeing rather than just thinking, you know, seeing directly. It's, it's one thing. And when you read it, uh, when Juan says it, he says the same thing, you know. But he says it in colloquial language, so it's, uh, it's a lot. Uh, sometimes it carries a simple punch. And uh, so I, I do agree that it's very nice. So we take a two minute break to uh, change tapes. Well, maybe we can speak off the record in the meantime oh, while they. The <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Too bad. This talk will continue on the next CD. I have a difficult name, Fritjof. Sure. Now, you can provide the last question on Castaneda, but I'd like to have a follow up with another short question. Um, I want to know if you saw John Wan's concepts of power to be purely metaphorical and No, no, very real. You can experience them yourself. That's one of the things you can really experience. The whole, all the teachings that, that are in Journey to Ixtlan, you can really experience yourself. They're closely related to the Taoist concept of, of Te, which is in the Tao Te Ching in the title, which is also often translated as power or, or virtue. It's uh, the fact that you, um, you can develop your intuitive spontaneity to a point where you sort of tune in with the universe. As the Taoists would say, you flow within the Tao, you flow in the current of the Tao, you recognize its patterns and you can adapt to them. And if you flow like flowing in a river and adapt to the movements, then you can do things which you won't think that you can do. So other people who watch you uh, will think uh, that you're just lucky. You know, you do feats that are you know, normally impossible to do. And because you, in, you develop your spontaneity and uh, your intuitive sense, and then people would say, well, that was just luck. And this is precisely what Don Juan says. He says there's, there's a passage where he says, power is like, personal power is like a feeling. It's like being lucky. And that's a feeling you can have. You know, I haven't had it often, but sometimes at rare times that I you know, could do things you know, that were just, I didn't think I was able to do them. And, it felt like being lucky, but it was this personal power. So, so I, uh, give an example very real. From, uh, sure. Uh, just as an example of this, at the beginning of the journey to Ixtlan, uh, Juan is Don Juan is trying to uh, train, so to speak, uh, Carlos in in the unexpected, in in dealings with things spontaneously. So he's doing things unexpectedly, and and Castaneda is getting extremely disturbed uh, psychologically, and finally he says, you're driving me up the wall with your unexpected behavior. And Don Juan says, you're driving me up the wall with your expected behavior. <laughs> <laughs> the next question, uh, again directed to Dr. Faber, Are, aren't your remarks about the probability representation of physical matter equally uh, applicable to other disciplines which examine naturally variable states with statistical or empirical models. For example, comparative psychology, ethology, ecology, etc. And doesn't the analogy of Taoism work precisely because mystic philosophers build similar intuitive, non-discrete models of reality? I think I would like to talk about this tomorrow because this is a whole wide subject. The, the possible implications of uh, these concepts for psychology and for other fields. I think if it's that would be a very interesting area to get into tomorrow. Yeah,
if you don't mind. Because uh, that's something I'm really interested in. And um, I've, I've had discussions with psychologists and, and physicians and people in various other fields over the past two years that, that I'm going to turn into a book. And I'm really very interested in the whole aspect. But it will take a long time now. When you run out of those, no? uh, I, don't, I, I wonder if I may ask uh, Fitzgerald a question, too. <laughs> We might have to wait a little more. <laughs> but by postponing that to tomorrow, we sure it'll be annoying. Here's the question. Uh, this is to Dr. Melvin. Uh, the uh, questionnaire would like you to speak about introception, but I'll only give you. <laughs> <laughs> Start counting. Can you do it? Well, either you have it or you don't. <laughs> 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 okay, next question. <laughs> That's a good one. You want to say about Lamar? Or would you, uh, like well, I think the world's greatest expert on, on that, uh, who has coined the word himself, is Dr. Franklin Merrill Wolf. And I can strongly recommend his books to you. His first book was called Pathways Through to Space. And it's been reprinted uh, recently. I think it's in paperback with a, a foreword by uh, Lily, the, uh, the dolphin man, who, of course, made, made the, him much more popular. Uh, Lily says that uh, encountering Franklin Merrill Wolf's work uh, restored his optimism. I mean, he, he had lost faith in the future. And, in this, uh, and uh, Dr. Wolf is indeed a Western yogi, an authentic Western yogi, he was trained both in mathematics and in philosophy. He was at, at Harvard at one time as a young man. He left that career and devoted himself to uh, yoga in the widest sense. And he, uh, he, just went, he had a very, very profound uh, realization experience in his uh, late middle life. He's uh, still alive. And uh, he has a more uh, formal work called The Philosophy of Consciousness Without an Object. And there will be uh, still a third work, uh, which is uh, the end of that formal work called Introceptionalism, which uh, we hope to see published soon uh, by the uh, Himalaya Press here, the Himalayan In International Research Institute here. So I, I can recommend uh, his work to you. And it is, of course, about realization and awakening, but on a very uh, profound uh, uh, level. I myself think it's, it's going to be a great classic in philosophy. It's the, I think it's the culmination of the idealist philosophies. Of, what Kant was indicating, and what the two great, some two great geniuses of philosophy, Plato and Kant, were pointing to, I think is fully described in, in, and explained, really, in, in his work. That should be a come on to you. Yeah, we'll buy them instantly, <laughs> tomorrow. Uh, Dr. Caper again, uh, do you not find similar parallels in Christianity? I do not recall any occurring in your book. Uh, yes, that, in fact, I'm asked that often, and uh, I'm convinced that they are there, but I don't, uh, haven't studied them. For some reason, I found it easier to study the Eastern traditions. I think mainly because uh, mystical traditions in the West have always played a, a minor role and were always suppressed by the official line of the religion, whereas in the East they constitute the mainstream of philosophical and religious thought. So it's comparatively easier to get hold of Eastern texts and uh, to study this, the Eastern traditions. But I've no doubt that these exist in the Western traditions. Uh, I might add to that that the latest special issue of the American Theosophist addresses itself to the esoteric conditions of the West. Mm, thank you. That'll be tomorrow also with the psychology because they go hand in hand. Dr. Melvin, tell us more about the proton that travels at infinite rates of speed. The photon, I guess that should be. How is it oh. possible with anything of a physical nature? Okay. It's not traveling at infinite speed. You see, the distance it has to cover is zero, and the, dist and the time it takes it to cover it is zero, so that it's still traveling, from our point of view, at the same speed. That The, the photon speed is always... Uh, if you want to summarize the special theory of relativity in a Madison Avenue slogan, you say, uh, one cannot catch up the least bit with light. 
that's, that's what the special theory of relativity says, essentially. One cannot catch up the least bit with light. No matter how fast you travel in the same direction a photon is going, it's always traveling with the same, the basic universal speed. So that's always true. Oddly enough, even for a photon. But in the case of the photon itself, all lengths in the direction of travel shrink to zero, and the time it takes to cover them shrinks to zero. So, so that's why the universe as a whole folds up to, to a photon, just like a, an accordion. I have a question. So what do you mean by s when you said before that it takes light eight minutes to get here from the sun? That's as we measure it. Our, uh, we, we, the distance to the sun, from the sun to here, is uh, 93 million miles, I mean, 100, and, you, know, you know how it is. And, uh, and then the time it takes to travel is eight and a half minutes. You divide one number by the other, you get the speed of light. If you are moving very, very fast uh, in the, from the sun to the earth, then the distance between the sun and the earth would shrink, would become smaller. That's one of the consequences of special relativity. The distance measured would be quite a bit smaller. The time it takes would be smaller. But the ratio, which is distance over time, is always the speed of light. That's a universal fact. Fundamental fact that Einstein realized would, would change our measures of space and time. That's the special theory of relativity. Now, if you ask me what is the Madison Avenue slogan for the general theory of relativity, I won't tell you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you can you explain what then, um, how do you distinguish what a full-time or what, a, um, you know, what it is? If it's, if it's like well, it, it has the, this wave-like property of being everywhere, in a sense, yes. Uh, it's, uh, it's not simple. Photons are not localized in the same sense that uh, particles with mass are. You see, there really is a difference between matter and light. There's a common uh, vulgar uh, statement that matter is equal to energy. That's not true. Dr. Capra, being a competent physicist, never said that in his book. He said mass and energy are e equivalent. In other words, mass is energy at rest. That's all right, mass, but not matter. Matter is distinct from radiation, from light. If you, if you want to know uh, what the facts are, uh, they are, uh, they are inequivalent representations of the inhomogeneous Lorentz group or Poincaré group. You know I'm what sure that, that is. I'm sure that helps <laughs> you a you lot. But they are entirely <laughs> different entities. They are different. Matter and radiation are not the same. So that's why I can say these things about photons that you wouldn't say about a material particle. No matter can travel with the speed of light. Yet it's an oddity of the quantum physics that we have in us all the time uh, virtual entities which are light essentially light. We are continually, you know, all these virtual photons that you're full of. You're full of light. You are creatures of light. It says so in St. John's Gospel, doesn't it? Yeah. I mean, that's the same thing. Uh, Capra or Dr. Melvin, I have heard that over the last year or so, a particle has been discovered that differs in behavior from observer to observer. And I know that at least one mystic is called as the particle of the soul. The particle that reacts uh, according to the expectations of the observer. Have you heard of this? Well, no, that's... No, I haven't heard of this, but uh, the behavior of all particles depends on the observer. This is not true of any particular particle. For example, whether an electron will show particle properties or whether it will show wave properties depends on how you observe it. And you, as the observer, can ask it a particle question, then you'll get a particle answer. Or you can ask it a wave question, then you'll get a wave answer. And which question you ask is your personal uh, decision. This is how the consciousness of the human observer comes into the game of quantum theory. But there's not, as far as I know, any particular particle that behaves differently from observer to observer. I would hope so. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know whether I can close with this. Uh, do want, we want to continue uh, or stop uh, or consummate the evening and continue tomorrow or what's the pleasure of the audience? Okay, one more question. One more question. Okay, then I'll, I'll save that just for the occasion. The question is, I would I, like okay. to ask a question about man. No, that's not the one I want to ask. The question is, Dr. Melvin was going to say something more about the destruction of the world. I thought that would be a fitting way to... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she sent us to bed with happy dreams. Uh, yeah. Well, I don't like it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but... Uh, I think, oh, the destruction of the world. Oh, yes, of the Earth. Yes, of the the Earth. Yeah. End of life oh, of yes, Earth. yes, yes. Yeah. Well, it's a wonderful uh, and interesting uh, prospect that, uh, that we were born out of a supernova and may die by a supernova. 
these supernovas that I described to you with such uh, enthusiasm, they, uh, you see, uh, they release an enormous amount of energy. Now, it's very unlikely that, that, our, uh, that anyone will go off very near us, but you see, as we travel through space, about once every hundred million years, we may be near enough to a, a massive star like, uh, well, even Arcturus is big enough. So if I were writing a science fiction story, I might call it Death by Arcturus. And uh, you see, and if we were within 30 million, I mean 30 light years of, of a star like that, just even 30 light years, which is quite a distance, it would destroy life on Earth probably. Not immediately. You see, it would go off, there would be a great big blaze, but uh, what would happen is that within uh, 50 to 100 years or so, the radiations that have, would reach us from that star, you see, they're not all light uh, particles too, would uh, would uh, knock out the ozone layer of the atmosphere. See, that's a real danger. If we don't do it first, a supernova might do it. Uh, the ozone layer of the atmosphere protects us from ultraviolet radiation. How likely is that to happen? Well, as I say, maybe once every hundred million years. At least that's the estimate. I, I haven't made the calculation myself, but it seems that's, uh, that's see, that's not so probable, but it's, it's astronomically, that's a short time. Now, what happens if the ozone layer of the atmosphere is knocked out to a substantial degree is uh, first, uh, of course, you, you might suffer terrible cases of sunburn, but, uh, which is not, Im I'm not impossible. I mean, you could, we could all become troglodytes, you know, cave dwellers. We could go underground and avoid the radiation that way. But uh, it's the biological results which would be catastrophic. Uh, they would probably, uh, there are biologists here, and they can speak to this. It would produce mutations of species to a degree that would, might be uncontrollable. So the option, of course, would be to try to emigrate fast, which is not very probable at, at present. Uh, we don't have the means to do it. But that's, uh, that's a possible end of, the, of life on Earth uh, that might, might happen. Uh, and also, as I said earlier, it's possible that the formation of the solar system was triggered by a supernova being not too far away, uh, the uh, stim the the energy that came from it may have caused uh, condensation. There's some evidence of that that's accumulated in the last year or two. How is the present health of our ozone layer? Well, I, I, I'm not an expert on that at all, uh, but I understand that it's, uh, it's not uh, altogether safe. It's, uh, I mean, people who work on it uh, are somewhat uh, solemn. They're solemn about it. And... Uh, it's so, it would be so easy to, to prevent a catastrophe, you know, just to just make, prevent you, stop using aerosol cans of the wrong kind, use some kind of rubber thing to squeeze instead. Mm -hmm. And it's just, uh, you know, it's like so many other things that are easy. The, the only thing that uh, prevents uh, being done is, uh, as, as uh, one eminent scientist said recently, stupidity or politics, and he apologized for using two synonymous words. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a good one to end. That's a good one to end. <laughs> this segment of the program has now concluded. The next segment will begin momentarily. Uh, Renee has some comment. Yeah, I, I would like to make a very, very short comment and then to uh, raise a question. Um, Mel mentioned the uh, theosophical philosophy, and it would be an instance, certainly to my mind, it is uh, uh, the most exciting instance of this integration that I spoke of yesterday, and that I certainly would hold out for without uh, concessions, uh, the integration between man and nature, or the so-called uh, outer and the inner, or so-called knowledge and uh, value theory, or behavior, or ethics. Now, um, in theosophy, that those connections are quite explicit because man is held to be rooted in some eternal ground of being whose nature he can know and therefore translate into his daily life. My question to bring um, us back to the main uh, topic of this uh, symposium is in what ways does the new physics bring 
its insights to bear on the life of man, or to put it differently, some people, even the student generation whom I know very well teaching them, take the view, all right, this is, this is interesting, it's even clear, but so what? How does it affect man's life? And that's the question I'd like to address to both Fritjof and Mel. Well, first I have to answer with another question. Uh, how long do we have to use this language, man and his life, and man and him, and so on, and how long is the Theosophical Society going to use it? I Versus feel offended woman? by it, yes. Oh, I would love, may I respond to that? Yes. Being, <laughs> being a member of the yes. disputed minority, who yes. might feel uh, chastised by it, but does not. I, You're a majority, I you're not a minority. Yes. Right. Here I, let's oh, here say, you, <laughs> um, you see, I never feel troubled by the use of the word man or mankind, although I am a fervent believer in women's liberation, because I take it in the Sanskrit sense of the word. And the word man really doesn't have to do with male or female, but it comes from the Sanskrit term manas, which has to do with mind, the thinker. Manas is the thinker, and the thinker is that stratum of any one of us that has nothing to do with sex or uh, gender. Therefore, when I uh, speak of man, mankind, I'm speaking of the species that thinks and asks questions about itself. So well, that, I'm very comfortable yeah, with the word. It all sounds very nice, but that's not how people hear it, and that's not how they take it, you see. It's you don't, we don't live in a Sanskrit society. We live in a Western <laughs> society, which is a sexist society, and this is sexist language. Whether you want it to be or not, it is, and I think we have to become aware of that, because it does have consequences, you see. If we go on speaking like this, we are going to perpetuate a society where men have all the rights and women are supposed Pressed. And it's the very language that makes that, that is part of that. So well, I mean, I I'm perfectly uh, open to. <laughs> I would say I'm, I'm perfectly open to uh, to new uh, coinages. It doesn't make any difference. But as I know, I always tell my students, I think it's living role models that matter. And if you have a woman get up and speak about the task of mankind being self-discovery, I think that to some degree wipes out the vocabulary itself, but I'm happy to, to adopt oh, a new why vocabulary. Why do you say humanity? The, you have the root manas in there again. Yeah. Man, humanity. That's the problem, no, but right. it doesn't that's matter. Right. I'm willing to adapt it, and I'm hoping we can get on to the question. I How does the new physics you. bear on humanity? <laughs> or womanhood, for that yeah. matter. I've forgotten your question now. <laughs> <laughs> that's what right. emotion is. How, How does the new physics the Tao, that, that law, that way, relate to the individual? Well, uh, my approach to this is uh, precisely <coughs> in the way I've outlined just before. I think that the implications, well, I shouldn't, maybe I, I want to say a word first about physics as a model and, and reply to you. And I think I'll have to tone this down, because I've had a lot of resistance already, and I'm changing my attitude a little. Oh! Uh, <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> well, and um, you see, the main thing, I think, is to recognize how the various sciences have modeled themselves after Newtonian physics. And to recognize that being scientific right, right. does not mean you have to be Newtonian. Now, for that, the new physics can certainly be a model. Right. To remove uh, obstacles. Yes. To what extent, then, uh, the new developments in physics can be a model remains to be seen. But certainly, it is, uh, it is useful to see that the philosophy emerging out of physics is consistent with these approaches. So I will, I'm going to emphasize consistency more than, than a model, and one should model oneself after physics. And uh, then coming to Renee's question, I think the change we are going to see in the next few years towards a more ecological and holistic uh, attitude will come 
from two directions. Uh, first, it will come through women, through the participation of women in politics and in various aspects of our society, because traditionally women, uh, because of, of uh, various uh, cultural conditioning, women find it easier uh, most of the time to think in holistic terms and to, to live in, in, in this way and to uh, favor intuition and, and the, the whole the yin mode about which I've talked yesterday. And the second um, change I think will come through the field of healing, uh, through the field of therapy, because people are going to and are already uh, being fed up with Western medicine because it's it's more and more expensive and less and less effective. Hmm. And here is where people have real political power. Uh, if you have a headache and don't take an aspirin, that's a political act, I think. Because the only reason why they sell you aspirin is because the aspirin manufacturers want to, want to make a profit. So this is where we have real power and this is where the change will come. And I've become very much aware of that when you study uh, medicine and the various other fields of healing, then you are always drawn into social aspects of it. Not only because we live in society and we have to, to have a, a wholesome relationship with our social environment, but also because of the social conditioning of the medical profession and of the political conditioning. So uh, this will change our society tremendously and I think we are seeing this coming. I'm not sure how this is across the states, but certainly in California there's a big grassroots movement and I think in other places too, uh, which looks uh, for new methods of healing. And uh, also the, uh, the nurses are spearheading this uh, development because the nurses are the ones who deal with patients. Doctors deal with disease and nurses deal with patients, so there's a, a great uh, difference. So they usually are much more aware of, of uh, new developments. And I think this this will you know bring about all the other aspects that you are talking about. Yes, I think I'd like to say something about that too. Uh, yeah, I agree with uh, everything that uh, Dr. Capra said, and I I would uh, also agree with enthusiasm that. Uh, the, uh, about the enormous importance of uh, joining the other half of the human race. Uh, uh, in fact, it's a little more than half, as we said. Women outlive men. So, uh, this, I believe, is very far-reaching, and there is a connection uh, with physical thinking. That's, uh, that's uh, very interesting. Now, uh, the remark I would make, it's a complementary remark, is that in general, if you look at the history of uh, human thought and human life, uh, you notice that that scientific, the scientific world view does affect uh, people enormously. Uh, ideas do affect people enormously. Well, I mean, there's uh, dramatic uh, cases of ideas affecting people. Uh, uh, Carlyle once listened to an argument about this, you know, uh, and uh, about whether or whether ideas have any influence on life, and he said, uh, he said a man wrote a book which was nothing but ideas, and people laughed at it, and the skins of the people who laughed at it went to bind the second edition of that book. He was, <laughs> he was talking about Jean-Jacques Rousseau's book, you know, and the French Revolution. Now, uh, but uh, ideas of Newton uh, influence the life of human beings enormously, as Dr. Capra has made very, very clear, very, very nicely. Uh, and uh, the present physics with its uh, discovery of, uh, well, such a remarkable discovery as the existence of matter and antimatter in the universe, and the fact that they are equal, of equal status, and so on, uh, as far as we know. But we happen to have matter around us, but in other parts of the universe there may be antimatter. We can make antimatter particles. We find a few anyway in nature. That may percolate down and have an enormous impact. The impact, I think, is again in the same direction of learning to live with the other, uh, learning to recognize the equality of the other. Now that is part of the, the feminist revolution, to recognize the equality of someone who is different from you, like you, but different from you. And I think the, the impact of that is, is, is enormous. It reaches down to the noetic, the, the noumenon level, because 
The biggest problem that every one of us has is to accept ourselves. To accept ourselves just as we are and uh, to really love ourselves. Charity begins at home. Now to be able to love the other is a step towards that. And uh, it's, it's, it's the same thing, actually. The equality, it's identical. I mean, it's not just there, but for the grace of God, go I. But there, go I, of course. That's what it is, ultimately. So I think this entire uh, development is, is always in the direction of making us accept that. And of course, uh, if we discover that there's extraterrestrial life, uh, we will be facing that problem squarely. I mean, it'd be extraterrestrial life, which is intelligent, perhaps more intelligent than we are, and we have to live with it, not shoot it down, you know, as, uh, as is the immediate tendency. So I think the impact of, uh, of this discovery that the universe is full of equal others, and they're all equal, I mean, an electron is equal to me as far as I'm concerned. In fact, in some ways superior, <laughs> because it bears no grudges, it has no memories, and so on. That, so. Uh, that suggests the title, I'm sure, of a bestseller would be Sex in the Atom. <laughs> or life <So>. in everywhere. <laughs> uh, Wes? Yeah. Uh, the stronghold of traditional science has always been its testability, and classical Newtonian science has employed formation and testing of hypotheses which are falsified. On the other end of the spectrum, we're a little bit more familiar with that thing, the strength of mystic religions and philosophies of ancient wisdom have always been their verifiability by introspection. All one really needs to do it, uh, is to meditate or to look within himself to be convinced of the sense of these mystical systems. Now, you've painted a really nice picture of a new holistic science, but I'm unsure at this point how the precepts of this new science are testable. If they are verifiable, uh, then I'd like to know how. And if they're not, of course, then this whole new science there really isn't useful to the culture. Well, as far as physics is concerned, all I'm saying comes directly out of the experiments done in physics laboratories, and so it, it comes out of experiments. In fact, it's the experiments that have forced us to adopt the holistic view, and it was a very painful experience, not for me, but for the people in the 1920s, for Heisenberg, Bohr, Bohr and so on. If you read Heisenberg's Physics and Philosophy or, or Physics and Beyond, it gives a very lively account of how painful it was for, for those scientists to uh, give, up, give up the Newtonian uh, fragmented view. Now, as far as... Uh, Holistic healing is concerned, uh, I agree completely with you. Uh, it will have to be tested and uh, we have to have some evidence and this is why I'm not going to work alone. One of the uh, doctors who is going to work with me is Carl Simonton, who is an oncologist and who has tremendous success in using meditative approach, a meditative approach to the cure of cancer. And he has got you know, all the statistics and all the tests and, and he's a competent, competent uh, physician besides being open-minded and having a holistic approach. So I agree very much with you. We are going to you know, have the empirical verification. It's sort of an epistemological question. We've sort of been bumping up, uh, bumping up against the edges of this uh, all the way along here. It seems to me that the me mechanistic tradition has given us uh, something of a commitment, a uh, rather rigid commitment, to uh, cause and effect in our learning process or our coming to knowledge. Whereas the mystic tradition, it would seem to me, would suggest that the mind has a capacity for a kind of spontaneous generation of knowledge. Uh, it seems to me there's a conflict here. I'm wondering if there is anything in the new knowledge or in your own reflections that can help resolve uh, this problem between cause and effect versus uh, what I'm calling spontaneous generation. Uh, synchronicity, uh, what, uh, what, a causal, uh, what do you mean by spontaneous Yeah, I generation? have the same question. Would you say a little more about what it's you mean by spontaneous generation? generation. Uh, spontaneous it has another meaning, you know, which is confusing. Uh, okay, you're right. That, uh, I see what else I mean. I think it means spontaneous generation in that it would seem uh, that when such awareness comes to our knowledge, it came without cause. Uh, now, of course, one can answer it simply that we don't know the cause, that we are unaware of the cause. Uh, or 
one can say that it is a divine cause or something like that. Um, most of these uh, answers seem to fall short when you uh, attempt to discuss them in the academic setting. Uh, can I just say a few words about that? It seems to me that um, Indian philosophy and certainly theosophy do not abolish uh, causation. What they do is to refine it and make it, in fact, far more extensive than you would have in the narrow scientific uh, Cartesian-Newtonian model. Uh, the notion, the, the concept of karma the law of action and reaction, is held to be an all-pervasive principle which introduces into this notion of causation the, law, the idea of justice, universal justice, such that no um, event can take place, whether it be physical, psychological, uh, moral, or cosmic, without having its inevitable consequences embedded in the universe itself or in the event itself. Therefore, it must bear fruit of some sort. So in a sense, causation, I think, is not reduced but is widened to embrace man, nature, and so forth. Now, the difference, and I think this is a decisive difference, is that the shift occurs from a neutral, blind, what I would call mechanistic causation to a far subtler, type of causation involving all levels hmm. of energy, all types of energies, thought, feeling, and so forth. And therefore, you have in an elegance, in an elegant, let's say, uh, uh, one singular principle, you have both interrelatedness of all sorts of events in the universe and the moral consequences thereof. So this would be my viewpoint on that. Well, believe it or not, modern physics goes very far in this direction. Uh, there are two uh, effects which uh, have influenced our Newtonian picture of rigid cause and effect relationship. Uh, one was uh, quantum theory and the other one relativity theory. In quantum theory, we have come to realize, to recognize probability as a very basic feature of the atomic and subatomic reality. Uh, events are governed by probability and don't occur with certainty. So you can have a particle disintegrating, for instance. Uh, you have a neutron, for instance, that comes along and at a certain moment disintegrates into a proton, an electron, and a neutrino. And nothing causes this decay, as we call it, or this disintegration. There's no particular cause for this event. You can never predict when it will disintegrate. You can only predict the probability. Nothing causes it means no single event, no billiard ball that hits the other billiard ball causes it. That's the Newtonian question, uh, the Newtonian concept of cause and effect. Now, it doesn't mean that the disintegration of the neutron is completely random and lawless. That's a very common misconception that is made held even by very bright people that uh, quantum theory introduces randomness and lawlessness. That's not true, but uh, the causality principle is wider, as René has just said. Uh, the whole determines the individual event. The probability is determined by the dynamics of the whole system. And that's where we have the difficulty to accept that individual events are determined by the whole and not by other smaller individual events. Well, that's one effect on, on uh, a causation. Uh, through physics. The other one comes from the concept of time. Uh, in particle physics, as I've said already, we have difficulties with the concept of a linearly flowing time and uh, we often have to abandon it. What we do in, uh, in our field theories, for instance, is we draw diagrams where particles are connected, are interconnected over a four-dimensional region of space and time. And we don't have any definite flow of time uh, associated with these diagrams, so that you cannot speak about cause and effect any longer. Because cause and effect, in the primitive notion of cause and effect, holds only if one event occurs before the other one. Then you can say it causes the second one. But if there's no definite direction of time, you don't have any cause and effect. Now this is also what mystics have been telling us, that in transcending 
ordinary notions of time, you also transcend notions of cause and effect. Or you break the bonds of karma and you know, other words they're using to that effect. So, so physics again goes very far in this direction. Yes. Uh, I want to ask a question that doesn't really have anything to do with a lot of these things. Um, you've been talking a lot about modern things, and there is a, what we might say, sort of a tradition among people within the Theosophical Society that sort of is, is really what they call modern physics is sort of a rediscovery of things that have been known way back. And in fact, they're um, people living in the world who have perpetuated sort of an ancient wisdom from way back where people knew all of these things. And I don't know if you know much about the, speaking to Dr. Copper, about the history of our society, but it was one of the instigators, and it was a, a peculiar old Russian lady named Madame Lovasky who purportedly, uh, through her knowledge of physical laws, which maybe modern physics hasn't yet discovered, could produce all kind of peculiar phenomena, you know, that things fly around the room and whatnot. And supposedly these things were done in front of, you know, rather well-known scientists of that period, Crooks and Edison and other people. I just wondered what you, what you think about extending it, going that far with it. Well, first of all, I don't think that modern physics is just rediscovering things that have been known before. You see, um, you have to realize that uh, a mystical tradition or a theosophical tradition or a, a psychic sensitivity and these various traditions are much more than just a certain view of the physical world and of physical phenomena. They, they go into much further realms. On the other, they, include that. they include that, but they go much further. On the other hand, physics is much more too. Physics is not just a view of, of the physical reality. It is also experimentation. It's all the mathematics, all the technology, and so on. But the two fields overlap. And what I'm studying is the overlap. And they overlap in their general worldview. And this is what I can compare. But you can't say that physics is just rediscovering things because it is doing much more. It's based on rigorous experimentation. It has a very sophisticated mathematical language. It has predicting power, for instance, which uh, many of the other traditions don't have to that extent, and so on. So it's, it's a different approach, but they overlap. So, uh, you know, men and women throughout the ages have developed different approaches to knowledge of reality, and they've come up with different models and different descriptions and very often they overlap. Can I just add one small uh, note to that? Don't you think it might be said that while physics per se, we understand this technical body now of knowledge in the last, whatever, five centuries or four has, is perhaps novel, the common denominator that some people might claim studying mysticism and let's say the ancient knowledge or wisdom and physics is that one postulates, or in some cases one is certain, that there are underlying principles that have been known through the ages that make such disciplines as contemporary physics possible in the first place. I think that would be the claim. One would not say that uh, 20th century physics is but a restatement of some kind of physics known in whatever century BC, but one would say it is the, tra it is the translation of those principles that are real and in fact govern this universe, the translation of those principles into modern uh, scientific data verifiable on even, let's say, the empirical plane. I think that's usually where the common denominator is uh, drawn, well, not I'm, well, in any I'm, other way. What I'm trying to say, if it is a fact, and I don't know if it's a fact or not, if it is a fact that somebody like Madame Levesque could take a teapot from over here and disintegrate it and make it come back together over in another room, then she must have known something about atoms and electrons and the structure of matter. Uh, would she not? Well, I suppose so. I mean, this this goes back even to the second century, if you like, AD or BC, it's hard to know, uh, to Patanjali, the cities, the powers, perhaps superpowers, we would say, uh, of, an, uh, of a liberated consciousness of a yogin who has mastered the laws of matter. 
uh, as to fractionating and recombining what we call compounds, atoms, and so on, is not does not fall outside of laws of nature. It's simply an extension thereof. And it's perhaps a more dramatic I would like form. To make a, oh. I'd like to make a comment here. Uh, actually, uh, what may look like a small point, but is, a, I think, a very important. And I have noticed that uh, most of my colleagues don't make this distinction. And they should. I mean, if they're scholarly enough, they should. In other words, if they know their field. Um, I don't mean Capra. I mean physicists in general. There's a very important change of terminology that we should make. Uh, it's, just, it's, I think, just like the change from calling everything man and so on in, instead of referring to the human being. Uh, we should not talk about physical uh, when we mean material. There is a difference between material and physical. Uh, materialism is quite different from physicalism, for example. You see, uh, many of the things you're talking about are material phenomena. And uh, we in physics know things that are physical but not material. Light is not matter. It's distinct. It's a different kind of phenomenon. It obeys different laws from matter. Light, though there are similarities, light particles do not are not like material particles. Light waves are not like matter waves. There is a distinction, a fundamental distinction. And so, uh, for example, the principle of relativity, you can't catch up the least bit with light. You, made of matter, cannot catch up the least bit with light. So, and neutrinos are also like light. So there are different kinds of non-physical things that, uh, non-material things that we know are physical, you see. They're part of physics. And therefore, uh, for example, I'm not, a I'm not a member of the Organization of Theosophy. I belong to the wider Theosophical Fellowship, if you like. But I, I believe the Theosophists have always said this for, you know, and the, and the Vedantists and the, the all six schools of Indian philosophy, that there are realms which are physical, but not material, you see. They, they didn't use our terminology, but that's essentially, oh, that's a clarifying point. You, you, you get the distinction. Man's uh, or woman's subtler bodies are not necessarily material, matter in the usual sense, but they could be physical in some larger sense. So there's a scheme of law. Now your question is really a question about the coupling. Uh, it seems to me, uh, if we want to want to make a, a pretty lo a probable hypothesis about what goes on, it's about the coupling, the interaction between subtler levels, subtler forms of, of physical reality, and material reality, you see? Just like there can be a, a coupling between uh, electromagnetic waves and matter. See, these are called electromagnetic transducers and so on. So there can be a coupling between these. It's a weak coupling, normally quite weak. So normally you don't see levitation and you don't see uh, all these other phenomena that you're referring to. And indeed, uh, when there are claims made for it, there's usually a mountain of dross for a few nuggets of, of, rea of truth, you know. I mean, you, you must be very careful about believing. You must be also very careful about not believing. So I, I think while these things do occur, I'm quite sure they do. I used to be a referee for Rhine's Journal of Parapsychology, and I visited the laboratory several times. And, and of course they occur. I mean, there's no question about that in the, in the mind of any honest person who has looked into the matter. But uh, they are very rare, and the coupling, therefore, is quite subtle and weak. And, or at least it's, uh, it's not, in, not easily produced in the laboratory. And uh, it's often simulated, but not produced. So uh, we are somewhat in a, in a bind as to what it means. Now, I can just remark on one uh, thing that seems to be a fact, which is rather striking, and uh, I suppose someday physicists are going to take it very seriously. Uh, somebody, uh, has a man named Miller, I think, ha who's a physicist, has looked at the binding of water, for example, that o Olga Warrell has worked on. Uh, Olga Warrell is a healer, and Dora knows very well and uh, Olga has considerable power, and he has looked at uh, the spectroscopic uh, uh, pattern uh, that's involved, and he has found, uh, to, uh, somewhat amazingly, that the bind, that this water, which has been made holy, so to speak, by being handled uh, by a, a powerful healer, has a different uh, uh, physical chemical uh, structure than the, the usual. The binding is, has been weakened. There's a definite change, quite a percentage change. This is a Nobel Prize type experiment. He, he, I don't think he publishes in the usual journals or whatever. He, he has a job with DuPont or something like that. I don't know the exact status. Uh, you may know more about it. He's getting his PhD in about six months. 
Well, this is another man. A man I'm talking about is an older man. Douglas Dean. Douglas Dean. Well, that's somebody else, yes. But uh, in any case, there is a, clearly an effect on, on the physical structure of matter, which is somewhat documented, but uh, imperfectly, and somehow uh, it will have to be incorporated into uh, physical science. Again, I would say the probable hypothesis, though not necessarily, you mustn't take this as true, in any sense, but it's probable that there is some kind of coupling between the subtler levels and the usual levels. So the usual level of matter is, a, is, is in a, embedded in a matrix of subtler vestures, uh, as Shankara called them, or whatever you want to call them. And there is some interaction, but it's not uh, the usual kind, and it seems to be very much influenced by consciousness, by intention, by uh, non-ulterior motivation, very strange things to the old science, you know. The fact that a person is detached and it doesn't have an ego investment in the, in the situation seems to make a difference as to whether they can produce the phenomena or not. It's a kind of a paradox involved. John, I'd like to hear about a couple of comments to that question that was raised back then. Well, uh, really very similar. I would have said essentially the same thing in, in different words. Uh, I get this question quite often, as you might imagine, and what I usually say is that uh, we, when we deal with the world in trying to understand the various phenomena, we cut it up in certain ways. And Descartes, among others, has influenced us to a very great extent so that we separate the, the mental or the spiritual from the material. And in so-called paranormal phenomena, it seems that you can't make this separation, that you have to divide the world in divide re reality in different ways in order to be able to account for these phenomena. So uh, what we need is, is an approach that uh, combines uh, psychological aspects and uh, physical aspects. I don't believe that uh, Madame Blavatsky disintegrates the teacup over there and makes it reappear over there. And I don't believe that it is just uh, just hypnosis, but it's something in between. You see, there's, there's matter is involved in some uh, essential way, and uh, psychological structures and transformations are involved too. And we, at present, we don't have a framework to, to unify these. We can either deal with psychology, then we say, well, that's just the hype, you know, people just believe that, they're made to believe it. Or we say, well, matter disintegrates, so what about conservation of energy and all that e equals mc squared and so on. But uh, we can't deal in these just two separate categories with these phenomena. So what, what I think would be needed, if you wanted to study this uh, carefully, and, and I can speak later to the question whether, whether this should be done or not, but if you want to do it, then I think you have to do it in an interdisciplinary approach where you, where you have physicists, psychologists, biologists, anthropologists, um, people who know about ritual, r religions, ritual magic, and so on, and working together to try to get Oh, I have a comment, phenomenon. just a small yeah. comment on that. Speaking of anthropologists, I, I recalled something very that may interest you. Uh, I, when I was a young uh, teacher at Columbia University many years ago, I uh, used to have lunch occasionally with the famous uh, woman anthropologist, Ruth Benedict. And uh, she told me that um, these paranormal phenomena occur. In fact, her grandmother used to be able to walk down the stairs in Switzerland with a table hanging from her fingers. And she found these paranormal phenomena, a <laughs> small table. I don't know why she would do it that way, but <laughs> you know, you never know about grandmothers. <laughs> uh, now, uh, but Ruth Benedict said that these phenomena occur in cultures which believe in them very commonly. They do not occur in cultures which don't believe in them, you see. So this is a very general anthropological phenomenon. It's quite interesting, you see. The uh, impact also, of course, as you know, of voodoo and such things, is great in cultures which believe in them. And uh, people who do not believe in them are often insulated, armored, and so on. Not invariably, but there is a very important individual psychological factor and collective psychological factor, the energy fields and so on, whatever you want to say. But uh, I, I agree quite uh, completely with what uh, Dr. Capra says, that it does require a broader and interdisciplinary uh, view.
Could you speak a little bit more about that water that was treated by that healer and then after World War II started and uh, some change in the structure? Well, it's simply that there is a, a, a binding, you know, that holds uh, the two uh, the two hydrogens together with uh, an oxygen, you know, H2O, that makes up uh, ordinary water, right? And this uh, binding it was changed. I don't recall exactly by how much, but a few percent. The uh, the, the, uh, the actual, uh, I think the actual distance between them was altered somewhat too, and they, so that the chemical bond was altered, altered. The hydrogen bond was also modified? Was modified, yes, yeah. yes. Uh, somebody here may know the, uh, the reference a little more completely, but uh, I, and evidently uh, there's some more work going on with uh, Douglas Dean. But I've actually read this uh, account by Miller and also heard Waller, or Olga Warhol talk about it. And uh, there doesn't seem to be any question. She, you look at the spectrograph, uh, spectrographic uh, picture and you see that it's, it's, it's happened. So some things go on like that. Of course, uh, healing is an enormous field uh, in which there's been an enormous amount of empirical ver verification. And Dora Kunz could tell you much more about that uh, than we can. Yeah. This talk will continue on the next CD. I think uh, it's uh, the nature of a holistic approach to life or reality that wherever you start, uh, you'll end up anywhere else because that's the very nature of everything hanging together. So it doesn't really matter where you start. Uh, and, uh, you know, I started in physics and then branched out into uh, psychology and medicine and psychotherapy, biology. And uh, this brought me to deal with economic and political questions. So, for instance, if I go to a supermarket and buy uh, a toothpaste, then I won't let them put in a paper bag because the, the toothpaste is already in a, in a tube which is in a cardboard box. And if you want to put that box into a paper bag, it's, it's just a waste of, of paper and a, a waste of of uh, trees and so on. So I always tell them to take it out again or, or you know, sometimes I'm, I don't pay attention so they put it in, I have to tell them to take it out again. Most of the time I say I don't need a bag and then they always look surprised. Most of the time in supermarkets, in fact, they give you two bags. They put one bag into the other and then the thing into the bag. And, and all these, I think, are, are actions in, in this direction. The whole question of ecology, you know, is, is goes very much in this direction. And that leads to a certain frame of mind. And if you have this certain frame of mind of considering uh, the whole structure and the context in which uh, one lives, then this, this will lead to uh, prevention of crime and, and various other factors. I can only see this way. Uh, perhaps one other way to look at this. Um, in Eastern philosophy in general, but certainly in theosophy specifically, there is a powerful uh, tool by means of which one could address a kind of question that Joanne has raised. And that's the whole idea of intent or will, or to use theosophical terminology, thought forms. Uh, the energies that we generate, and I was hoping that the new physics would somehow pave the way, make a bridge between kind of energy now known and described, and prana, this particularly uh, human and um, psychological kind of energy. Um, intent or thought form is as much of a, a force generating effects as, as our material or physically visible kinds of interactions. And it would seem to me to specifically address your question, if we find ourselves surrounded by a chaotic social structure, which I'm afraid we, is, is our current plight, then wouldn't you think that at the very least, aside from avert political and social reform and activism, but in addition to that, and at the very least, each human being who is fully convinced of that, that he is a generator of forces, would hold himself very stringently accountable for what he pushes out into the world, whether it's beneficent hmm. or uh, injurious kinds of energies towards other people. Now, that's not easy. And therefore, I want to uh, uh, stress once again, I think the whole question of 
uh, self-knowledge, um, self-discovery, the path, all these things that Eastern philosophy and theosophy has talked about. A whole way of life, a lifestyle, I think, is entailed with this, including the discovery as to why it's so difficult to do it. What makes me, let's say, violent, to use so a Krishnamurtian kind of... about TV. All right, TV, but even without TV. You see, that's my, this oh, is now my focus. I think TV might catalyze what I already have within. But even without TV, way back in the time of the ancients, Buddha, Plato, Patanjali, Shankara, uh, the, there was always the observation that man, woman, untransformed, the human species, untransformed, somehow can utilize its energies for ill, for uh, hate, for injury, as well as for brotherliness and good and so on. I think TV can uh, give me a sympathetic kind of resonance and, no, and heighten I, what TV, I have. TV is not something out there. TV is us because they base their programs on ratings. And if you don't true. watch the, the violin shows, they won't show them. Granted. And if this is, so. I mean, perfectly true. But I would say even if we were to do away with all the violent shows, something within man, isn't this what Buddha said, for example, something within man is the problem. And uh, freedom from that, uh, enlightenment, liberation, all this is far, a far more uh, difficult and wider task than merely a given social thing. Even if we uh, did away with yellow journalism and TV, if we no longer subscribe to it, I'm not saying we shouldn't do both, but still there would be a problem. Oh yes, but there, there are stages in, in uh, no problems sure. and in frustration and in violence, and we seem to go towards more, more valid yes. violence. But uh, the whole question of crime, you know, it's, uh, people think of violence when there's a murder, but uh, the institutionalized violence is not recognized. For instance, they, they are against violent revolution, but that the oppression itself is the first violence is, is usually not mentioned. So, you know, just to become aware of these things, you know, political consciousness raising is, is very effective against violence, and that will bring the crime rate down. There's no doubt. Dr. Kappa, is yeah. the repression and silence going to continue for much longer? Is, pardon? is the repression and the new concepts and the new science going to continue for much longer? What is your opinion on this? I don't, I don't understand. The repression, repression of, of the new science, science continue. What, what repression? I don't, know. I, I don't know what you mean. Uh, we have always had this repression. Yeah. I'm asking you your opinion if you think that the repression is going to continue. The political repression, you the mean? Political repression on uh, politics, on science, on uh, all the new aspects. Well, well I think it depends on us. I think. I think I think it's not because uh, we're not going to take it, and but it depends on us. I think we can do something, and and the ways I have outlined, you know, this morning, I think will be very effective. Uh, would you say? Would you call the time uh, four dimension with all the consequences that can be uh, brought up in this? Would you call time a fourth dimension? Uh, yeah. With all the consequences, uh, reaching as far as the concept of eternity and uh, oh yes, that's that's universe. that's one aspect of it. The you know um, extension of of our notion of time. I'm way back now. I'm still stuck on the previous discussion about uh, energy and particles. I think I got about three questions and a hypothesis all together here. Yes. Uh, as the physicists discover, as they search further and further, that there are smaller and smaller particles and more energy. Uh, what is the probability that there are no particles and only energy? And that the real world as we perceive it, which is made up of matter, this matter, is only the context in which we hold and perceive our world. And that if I were able to change the context within which I hold that, I would then be able to change what I perceive matter to be. Mm -hmm. And that I could then put my hand to the wall or do any of the other paranormal mm -hmm. uh, considerations. Well, first of all, it seems, well, very first remark I, I have that there are smaller and smaller particles, but not more and more energy. There's 
energy cannot be gained or lost. It's always the same amount of energy in a particular situation. Uh, and uh, we have become more and more sophisticated in, in our investigation of particles, but there are particles, there are patterns. There's one dynamic process that has certain patterns, and these patterns we call the particles. They are not independent entities, not building blocks that make up matter, but they are patterns in an overall process. And it seems that there are these patterns, as long at least as we stay within the scientific framework. I don't believe that there are any basic particles. I believe that uh, we will be able to explain these patterns from very general principles, from the general dynamics of, of an integrated whole. But as long as we stay in the scientific framework, uh, the patterns will be there. And so it will be useful to talk about particles. Now, the last part of your question, then if we alter the context, then we may see other patterns, or maybe no patterns at all, just the void, and then you're not, we're not scientific any longer. We go outside of science. So that's another reason why I say that uh, this uh, investigation of paranormal phenomena will lead us outside science. In fact, I've written a whole paper on this where I say that the situation in parapsychology now is very similar to the situation in atomic physics in the early 1920s. There, the question was, to what extent could you apply the uh, classical concepts to the new reality, to the atomic reality? And what physicists did was, at first, they did experiments and they tried to get a feel for what was happening. Uh, Heisenberg said they tried to get into the spirit of quantum theory before they had the theory. Once they had the spirit of it, that is, once they had an intuitive feeling of what to expect in a certain experimental situation, then they were able to construct a, a theoretical framework. And this is what happens now in parapsychology. But now we're not talking about classical concepts, we are talking about the scientific framework. It seems, as uh, I think Mel has said before, uh, that the more we... Uh, no, you talked about believing in things and then they happen. The more rational we are, the more analytic we are, the more paranormal phenomena seem to recede. So there seems to be some kind of dynamics there. Uh, the more rational you are, uh, the less you're able to perceive these paranormal phenomena. So we have to ask where are the limits of the rational framework and of the scientific framework. And I think at this stage now we have to get again a feeling for it, get into the spirit of it to be able what to expect in a certain experimental situation. And then we'll find the theoretical framework. Ultimately what I uh, suggested was that we'll need a new kind of uncertainty principle which gives the limits of the scientific framework. May I add something to that, Herb? Um, yeah, I agree, of course, with what uh, Kirchhoff says, uh, except to make it uh, clear to the layperson who is not in, in physics that um, we have certain hard rules, hard principles that make it difficult to dissolve the material world. There, there are conservation principles, as we call them. Certain things are conserved. In other words, before and after a reaction, they're the same no matter what and uh, this is this makes it a little bit difficult to just dissolve everything into a, a nice uh, background of energy uh, that is a, there's a conservation of the, the number of heavy particles for example so the particles like protons and, and neutrons and so on it just if, if there weren't that conservation principle, we wouldn't be here. The universe would have dissolved, uh, the physical, the material universe would have dissolved a long time ago. So uh, if a proton does really undergo uh, dissolution, so to speak, and, the, uh, and not just transformation to another particle like a neutron, then uh, the lifetime for that is much longer than the lifetime of the universe, much, much longer. People have been able to show by experiments that this is the case. So it's very stable. These things are very stable. Matter is very, very stable. That's why this disintegration uh, doesn't appeal to uh, Fritjof, I'm sure. Uh, and similarly, there are, there are several such fundamental charge type, type charges which are always conserved. Uh, the number of heavy particles, the number of light particles, of leptons, seems to be conserved exactly. The, uh, uh, the electric, electric charge, charge of course, is an old, famous conservation. The total amount of charge, plus and minus, added together, always the same, before and after. Never, never created or destroyed. 
again, with tremendous accuracy. So even though we haven't reached out and explored the whole universe, we've explored large chunks of the universe. In the lifetime of uh, one human being, the, uh, the Milky Way and the solar system move through a vast region of space, and there's been no change in, in these constants in, 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 within the experimental era. So all these things are very, very hard, crystalline facts in this uh, beautiful web that uh, Fritjof wants to weave. So I think we have to remember that, and it's not easy. That, that's what I meant earlier by saying matter is not the same as, as energy. Mass is the, happens to be, one aspect of matter happens to be the same in energy and, and matter, but matter is not the same as energy. Mass is the, happens to be, one aspect of matter happens to be the same in energy and, and matter, but matter is not the same as energy. I'd like to go back to something you said earlier about uh, Newtonian physics paralleling psychoanalysis. You know, I wonder if you could elaborate on that. Uh, the question was, uh, she asked me to elaborate on the parallels between Newtonian physics and Freudian psychoanalysis. Uh, Newtonian physics was based on the contrast between uh, empty space and matter. Matter were hard and solid material particles moving in empty space and colliding in empty space, drawn by forces. And uh, there's a, a principle in Newtonian physics that every force um, has, every active force has a reactive, generates a reactive force. Action equals reaction. Now, Freud established psychological space, uh, very much modeled after the Euclidean space in Newtonian physics. And he saw uh, the, psycho <coughs> the psyche as consisting of some basic psychological structures which he visualized very much like objects. These were the ego, the id, and the superego. And these structures, uh, psychological objects, were moving in psychological space and were also colliding and competing in psychological space. Uh, the forces uh, are, for instance, the drives. And uh, what is the reaction to the drives? The, I forgot that, resistance? Rep uh, repression, repression. Rep depression and, and the drive. So, so again, the forces were, were modeled after Newtonian forces. And you can go on and, and study the, the, the subtler elements. There's a paper on this by a psychiatrist from Montreal. His name is Douglas Levine, Dr. Douglas Levine. But I don't think he has published it. He's going to publish it soon, I think. And, and the paper is called uh, Physics and uh, Psychiatry. But I think, uh, in fairness to uh, Freud, who, who did, uh, in some ways, did a very important job of honesty, um, while limited and all that, he, there were elements uh, in it that, uh, that do resemble the new physics, too. Uh, for example, one of the uh, remarkable changes in physics uh, that, we, uh, that we have come to, and this, this may interest you because it has a broader philosophical meaning, too, uh, you know the Cartesian dualism, uh, which uh, Fritjof and uh, René have talked. The, fr uh, the uh, yeah, Cartesian like dualism. Uh, well, okay. Separates between objective and subjective. It's as if there's a, a sharp boundary between objective things that are objective and things that are subjective. I mean, light is objective, but the color I see with my nervous system and so on is is, is subjective and so on. Um, well, that uh, that boundary is is uh, is being is eroded, you know, and and uh, in physics it's been eroded uh, the, uh, the, because of this fact that uh, an electron, in a sense, exists only latently at times. You see, it's uh, what you get out of a particular physical system is like what you get if there's a latent image on a photographic plate, and you can develop it in different ways, you see. Depending on how you develop it, on the experiment you make, you'll get different results, you see. So there's a latency about existence, uh, which means that, that the line between subjective and objective has been changed. Instead, there's another uh, line, or, or plane, if you like, uh, which is between phenomena, this is again somewhat approximate, but between phenomena which are influenced by observing them and those which are not influenced by observing them. See, that's a different way of slicing reality. See, there are things which I can't influence by observing it. I, I, by looking at that 
at, at a large body like that table, I can't make it move normally, you know, normally. Paranormally, that's another story. And maybe Dora can make it move, but I can't. Uh, now, uh, on the other hand, if I look at an electron with uh, an electron microscope, it kicks it so hard that, that it does change it, you see. So um, there are this, there's this new split, and I think Freud, in a way, has the same split, same division, redivision, so to speak, in his... Uh, in his view of, of, in his philosophy of his psychoanalysis, yeah. namely that the, um, the, divi the division is, uh, takes this form, that if you're unconscious of something, it, 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 um, it is inexorable. You cannot avoid reacting a certain way, as long as you're unconscious of it. But as you become conscious of it, then you can change the behavior, you see. So there's a similar, uh, there's a certain parallelism here between uh, psychoanalysis and the new physics in that respect, that by becoming conscious of something that was previously unconscious, it alters it. It alters the phenomena. So observing it changes it. Yeah. There is also, however, a difference. And um, this uh, will bring out something that I've been uh, perhaps alluding to earlier. Um, for Freud, we are isolated individuals. We're bounded by our by the boundaries of our skin, and we're separate from one another. This is analogous to the situation about Adams, Dalton, and people in the 19th century. Everything is separate. And how are these separate entities linked? That is the mystery. Now, in physics, uh, in 20th century physics, field physics makes the whole primary, and the, the particles, the objects, derivative. They're just precipitates in that field. That part, I think, physics doesn't have uh, too much difficulty handling. What no one, <coughs> to my knowledge, in any science as yet, has um, really established, and I would hope that that is the next step, uh, which uh, creative scientific minds will devote their research lives to, is to investigate the psychodynamic field, which it's been held since ancient times in philosophy, theosophy, and so on, links every single human being together into one, it not only interrelated, but single psychodynamic, let's call it, or spiritual at higher levels field, such that we are not, in fact, separate individuals, but we are instantly interrelated, inherently interrelated, and it's only some kind of limited vision, which can be called maya, the measurable, and so on, that makes us think we are little blobs, isolated, that then need to create and forge bonds, which in fact already exist, just as in this bootstrap hypothesis in physics is asserted. I'd like to hear Fitcher perhaps comment on that. Well, there was one man who has devoted his whole scientific life to it, Carl Gustav Jung. Yes, that's correct. I should have added that, absolutely. Yeah, I was going to ask that because I know you spoke to the analytical psychology club yesterday and I was really surprised today to hear you talking about Freudism. Um, that, were, that, that is the model of the, the, the Newtonian physics and I was just wondering kind of what your change was yesterday because Jung really did make the collective unconscious. Right, that's what, what we were discussing, that uh, to what extent Jung went beyond Freud. In fact, it's interesting that uh, Newton, I'm sure, was much less Newtonian than any of the people following him. No? And Freud was much less Freudian than any of the Freudians after him. So uh, you, you know this phrase, you know the phrase he said, moi je ne suis pas Freudiste. <laughs> I, me, I am not a Freudian, he said. And uh, so it's interesting that, well, Freud was aware of the fact that his theory was modeled after Newtonian physics, but he was also aware of the fact that this is not, this was only temporary. And there is a quotation, and I can't give you the reference, but it's in that paper that I mentioned, that Freud said that he was waiting for new physics to come and to give a new conceptual structure and uh, which uh, an analysts could then use to further elaborate their theories. Also, Freudian practice was, was much advanced, was, was much ahead of, of Freudian theory. For instance, in theory, in psychoanalytic theory, there's a strict division between the observer and the observed. But in practice, this was not true, and Freud knew very well that there's a strong interconnection. The whole uh, phenomenon of um, 
uh, what's it called? Uh, transference. Transference. Yes. Yeah, thank you. The phenomenon of transference is, you know, is is of course a very dramatic effect of this uh, interaction, and Freud was very well aware of it. But the theory was sort of modeled after Newtonian theory. It's funny he would make that statement about waiting for the new physics when he resisted Jung's uh, whole concept of the collective unconscious. Mm -hmm. Well, fathers well, have right. trouble with sons always. <laughs> uh, no, but he, well, maybe he didn't know where the new physics, in which direction it would go, you know? Maybe he expected something else from the new physics. Freud also said that analysts are, at bottom, incorrigible, incorrigible mechanists and materialists. So he really believed in, in that aspect of physics. Yeah. And one, uh, I mean, footnote, uh, I think in Freud's papers, there is the statement uh, fairly well towards the end of his professional life that had he uh, for, had he more time or had he another professional lifetime to live, he would investigate the uh, unknown, the occult, and so on. I personally find his temperament wasn't perhaps in that direction, but he did at least pay lip service to it. He knew there was an intriguing area which escaped him completely. Yeah. Uh, one thing that Freud neglected also was the social context of, mm. of uh, people. It was easy at and, that time, you know, uh, Vienna of, was... Of, of course. It was, uh, it was it was that uh, that kind of society, and so all of this will have to be brought into psychology, the social context and uh, transpersonal context. It, over there. It, it seems like we've been dealing for thousands of years with the question of the propagation of this new uh, paradigm of reality uh, within what Pierre Teilhard de Chardin talked about as a new sphere, a sphere of mental energy mm -hmm. or knowledge throughout the world, throughout humanity, and the teacup is a discrete event within that new sphere. If everyone could buy teacups around, there would be no question about buying teacups around. But the question is more relevant to humanity today because just as we pass on the highways, the junkyards with broken automobiles, we have buildings full of broken human beings. And the United States is 35th in the world in longevity, primarily because of McDonald's and Bonanza and all the rest of it. I would like to ask uh, all of these people, what is the problem in, this is a new event, the propagation. We have televisions and satellites and we have all the technology. Through the ages, we have dealt with this problem of the knowledge is there. And I hear this constantly on television. You get one quote expert and another quote expert, and they talk through two sides you know, of a different, especially in the medical profession. How can we address this? Is there some kind of a social political formalism, a new S matrix theory, anything at all, that can address the issue of how do we sift out the truth Sounds like the eternal messiah question. I don't no. know whether uh, any of the speakers could have answered or not, but uh, you might want to I think, uh, I, I know that nobody wants to answer this uh, because we can't, <laughs> so, so right. I'll bear the burden. Yes, <laughs> but I'm sure really others awesome. will have. I think Fritjof expressed a very, very wholesome point. point of view, which is to do what you can, while you can, where you are, and, uh, and I, I admire his, uh, his uh, I didn't know, I didn't know him before this, and I didn't know this, but I think he does very well to refuse the paper bag and make every, everything count in that direction. And Rene certainly... Paper bag, not the paper bag. <laughs> paper bag. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But um, that's a question, of course, that has uh, shadowed my, my whole life. And uh, uh, I, uh, I, am, uh, I am deeply concerned about it. I think that uh, there, was, there are some optimistic notes uh, in, in this uh, terrible catastrophe. By the way, you... Uh, you really worry me because the last time I looked at the statistics a year or two ago, uh, a couple of years ago, it was we were 14th in longevity, and I'm not, uh, I don't disbelieve you that we might be sliding down the scale very, very rapidly. Of course, we are first in military armament in the world. Uh, yes, uh, basically, yes. So, um, well. Uh, there are some optimistic notes. For example, occasionally, even uh, among the politicians, you, you get this, uh, this report of the McGovern Committee, wasn't it, which advocates that uh, people uh, eat uh, fresh vegetables and fruits and so on, up to maybe 80% of their diet that they eat. 
things and so on. I, I really think there are measures people can take everywhere and they may, may come to take them by force almost. For example, uh, <coughs> sprouting your own sprouts is a very economical way to get uh, a good wholesome food and uh, of course uh, cultivating the natural food stores. Uh, Shall I give my food. Jerry Brown campaign talk now? No. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. And I think there are, there are signs like that and uh, it's, it's a very complicated problem, and I think we all have to be somewhat mature about it. Uh, we, my wife and I, and are somewhat, we're, we're not fanatics, but we're extremists ourselves in the matter of, we're, of food. Uh, we know people who are even crazier than we are, um, and uh, maybe one shouldn't be. I mean, maybe a little Taoism, where you mix in a little impurity with purity, is called for. But especially if you want to live with other people. But I think there are these, uh, these uh, wholesome signs that especially uh, the younger generation and many of the older generation influenced by their children are, uh, are uh, working to avoid uh, this kind of pollution. I, I think the pollution, the psychological pollution is also very great and the people make very little effort to avoid that, all of us. And uh, what Renee said, and she said it very beautifully, I thought, is very important that we, we ourselves radiate a lot of negative feelings and so on. And uh, this always sounds a little strange to someone who's lived a scientific life, but it's true, I'm sure, that you can radiate negativity and you can radiate positivity. You can make an enormous difference in your attitude. So if we believe in catastrophe, we're going to have catastrophe. Uh, and if we believe in the possibility of, uh, that the human race can save itself by its own bootstraps, why then we, it will. Uh, it will and it can. There's no doubt about that. Uh, now, uh, specifically on this uh, matter of uh, of what to do, I, I would suppose that uh, you could, as I say, cultivate the natural food stores, no, not necessarily the health food stores, because too many pills uh, won't do the job, but natural foods, and emphasize repeatedly that, uh, that it's just as much uh, a matter of uh, credulity and faith to, to go along with the supermarkets and so on as, uh, as it is to, to go in for natural foods. Um, and, uh, and I suppose one just has to resist the uh, enormous economic investment in, uh, in, the, in the present system. As to, as to why it happened, you know why it happened. I mean, it's, it's economics, power, ego, and so on. There's no question that that's behind it. Uh, as to how to prevent it, uh, I can, each of us has to work in his own way to, uh, to slow it down or to reverse it. And uh, it is remarkable that we have a president like uh, Jimmy Carter who at least gives lip service to conservation and to uh, disarmament and so on. And we have a, a counterpart uh, in, in the Soviet Union, uh, Brezhnev, who for whatever reasons, I don't know, has uh, advocated total disarmament. So these are rather hopeful signs that there are, there's a certain amount of sense in human life. There was one jo just one point I wanted to make about this. Uh, and that is that one does have to be mature in, ex in the expectations uh, that, for example, uh, Mr. Carter's uh, unilateral action in uh, you know, stopping certain kinds of nuclear development did not have the effect that he expected. So you have to be very, you have to be very intelligent, sort of realistic and mature as to how you go about it, you see. He didn't consult the Germans, he should have. Uh, the, the Germans, by the way, are, are be have been behaving extremely well, extremely, in an extremely civilized manner. They are uh, not selling arms to other countries, unlike uh, the French, the English, and the Americans, more than anybody else. We sell, what, 54% arms to the world now, something like that. And the Europeans sell 20%. But the Germans were insulted and annoyed by this unilateral action, and they continued to produce uh, nuclear uh, systems uh, and sell them uh, and because this is not you can't go about it too in too naive a way you, you, and, and nuclear power is is here at present it's the only realistic mm -hmm. way to do things so you have to work with it you know you have to choose so for example that you should you, if you have to choose this is a benefit risk argument you want to be sure that they're doing thorium breeding rather than plutonium breeding it's ten times safer it's uh, you know exactly how much the the dangers, the costs are. The danger of, of somebody stealing it is much less because you can detect it at a distance with gamma ray detectors and so on. So I mean, you've got to be realistic about these things. At the present time, 
we have to accept a certain kind of nuclear power. We have to work very hard to soon get solar power and other forms. But that's the way the world is, and, and so I, the la my last point is simply we must be somewhat realistic and somewhat mature and strategic about the way we deal with it. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, this is really an excellent question for bringing certain things together about which this conference is supposed to uh, uh, revolve. Not only is it true what you say, that there are a lot of broken people inside houses, but I think a genuine crisis, a uh, worldwide crisis, is on the horizon. I'm thinking in particular of this dangerous concept of triage. I don't know if you know about that, triage ethics. Define people it. like Garrett Hardinson. Triage ethics simply says that certain numbers of people, nations, underdeveloped ones in particular, um, are going to starve anyway. Therefore, given the projected future shortage of food, uh, they are not good investments for the solvent nations to share food with them. Therefore, let's write them off and let them starve anyhow. It was a concept that came up from uh, the notion of the wounded during World War I. All right, triage ethics has a number of uh, proponents, Garrett Hardin in California, among others. Now, here would be one example of a specific, direct application in daily life and in political life as to whether or not, uh, as to, let's say, how we look at the world, what we believe is real. You s Mel speaks of the term, let us be realistic. That term comes from the word reality. It matters how you define reality, what you will do about starving people. If you define reality as the new physics defines it, an interrelated whole, no part of which is outside that whole, no part of which is real apart from that whole, and if in addition you take the stand that humankind is one and individuals are only expressions of that oneness, of that one life. And that whatever happens to any part of that happens to all of it. Then you cannot consistently take the solution of the triage ethics, the lifeboat ethics people. Because even if it were moral, and it isn't, it is immoral, it isn't possible because it isn't realistic. If I say I am one with mankind, then I cannot possibly say the successful, the uh, industrial nations can eat while consciously letting others starve. Because it isn't just the question that it isn't right, but it isn't possible. If we don't take that view, if we say, yes, we can live and they can die, then we do not believe the new physics, or for that matter, the ancient metaphysics. I, w I want to support this very strongly and maybe get a little more specific. Uh, when you're talking, I wasn't familiar with this concept of triage, but it's, it's quite obvious to me that they say that some nations are going to starve anyway, but this is only half of the story. The other half is provided that we keep our profits at a constant or increasing level. And this is never mentioned, but this is what they always suppose. And also what Mel says about nuclear power. Nuclear power is necessary, provided that you want utility companies making a profit and distributing it. But we do have solar power, which could be generated in our backyard, and we, we wouldn't need any utility company. We'd, each, each unit would create its own power for living, and you know, heating homes and cooking and everything would come out of solar power. We didn't need a distributor. But that's not good business, and that's why it's suppressed. Just as uh, homeopathy or, or other healing methods are not good business, and this is why the AMA suppresses it. And it's just throughout uh, the line you see the argument is always economic, but the economical part is never mentioned. And so they tell you, well, let's be realistic and, and you know, somebody will starve anyway. I think a little bit of a Marxist thinking would be very healthy here. I was going to bring this up since you mentioned Jerry Brown and Hobbes, you know, that's what the point about this is. There's like basically two aspects, but it has to deal with politics getting involved with like the new age and everything. Like, first of all, as far as countries starving, 
It's been brought up by, I forgot the name of the people, that no country in the world can really starve because each person has enough land if he would grow it on his own. If you didn't, for example, grow coffee in South America, you didn't grow cotton. If each person had three quarters of an acre of land, for example, he grow his own food, he would live, he would survive, he would you know, have abundance. But how about, as far as example, as like Jerry Brown, or just say some new age people get involved in politics, is that their role, or should we just go more subtly instead of trying to overtly, like, corrupt our corrupted society. No, I, th I think the people who have a talent for politics should go into politics. People who have other talents should do what their talents are, but we should all recognize the political context of what we're doing. But it's just, you know, I see my role as writing and lecturing and teaching and doing research, but I see the political aspect of it. So I don't go in the streets to demonstrate. I do that too, but not very much. And, and so I, I work at ah. a different level, but I think the situation is such and the crisis is such that we have to use all offer efforts you know, and fight on all fronts. One, one, one short remark about that. You can do things that are uh, not overtly political. You can grow enough sprouts in your own front room with the windows that, that to, to sustain you. And sprouts are a very wholesome food, you know, mung and lentils and, and we've done it at times. It takes time, but you can do it. And the sprout terrains uh, are growing. You know, they're they're sprouting. Uh, they, they may there is a sproutarian movement, and they claim, of course, that living foods are the only foods you should live on. And perhaps they're right. Full of prana and all that. Now, in addition, you can uh, have develop more and more a small household economy, as many things are really inefficient uh, under mass distribution. They're better better to do it yourself. You you certainly should grind your own grain if you make bread. Uh, it's so easy and it's fresh and so on. Things like that, you, you know, you use technology just a little bit, you know, in moderation, and then from then on become independent of the supermarket, you see. So I think oh, everybody could do that. That would, that's like the, the ratings that Fritjof referred to. They simply won't, it won't work. The, the supermarket system won't work if you, if you don't participate in it. We don't use the supermarket very much, even though it's back to back with us. Uh, very, very, we go to a, an ecology, a co-op to which we belong, and, and we travel across the city, and we use gas to do it, but uh, you balance one thing against another. That's what I meant by benefit-risk. I'm sure I'm in the wrong as far as some of this uh, realistic, realpolitik I was mentioning, because I'm older, and that happens to you as you get older, you know, you have to watch that. But there is some, uh, you have to be somewhat sensible about what you can expect of the world. And uh, while solar power is certainly feasible, it is not developed at present and won't be for some years. And of course, uh, by the way, you might pay your respects to technology there. I'm overstepping my limits, but let me just say that if people develop a, phot a photovoltaic cell, you know, a cell that converts solar energy directly into electricity, that's um, just 10% 10, uh, 10 uh, uh, more effective than it is now, but well, then uh, it will become economically uh, feasible. It's e it will compete, but it isn't right now, you see. It's a sort of like a ratio of t 20 to 10 at the present situation. Cost 20 where it should cost 10. And so you see a technological solution to that is possible. And people should work on it. Physicists who do experiments should work on it. Maybe theorists should too. Well, and, and you know, lobbying is a good thing, right? To your Congress person or whatever, and, and because it's it's uh, legislation that has to favor the development of this research, which isn't done because the utility companies oppose it, and they have a very strong lobby in Washington. But until the end of this century, we're probably going to have to live with the nuclear reactions, but we should be very strict about them. We should stop uh, certain developments until they have been thoroughly explored for safety and so on. And, and so on. But encourage others because that's the only thing there is right now at the present. Uh, Unless you want to make a very radical break. And uh, we all have to make that break. I want to point out that there was a special issue in a publication called New Age magazine about two issues back on solar power that deals with all these aspects, the political, social and technological aspects. And it also uh, uh, has an article on Tutankhamun which I found very nice because it's it uh, unifies various aspects of solar power. Mm -hmm. Time for two more questions, sir. Yeah, coming over there. Aren't we getting a little bit off the track? Because what I hear discussed... Yes, right but it's 10 to 12. <laughs> what I hear discussed right now is, is mainly a discussion of words, and words are notorious at getting us into exactly the type of circumstances that we uh, uh, are talking about that we don't like. So my question is this. Uh, in a sense, Aren't we just sort of 
exchanging a mechanistic, rigid sort of uh, world philosophy and uh, universal philosophy for one which is a little bit less mechanistic and a little bit more vague. Because it seems like any time we try and put uh, these principles into words to verbalize them, to formalize them, then we're already reducing ourselves to atomistic uh, mechanisms and we're, uh, we're limiting ourselves too much. The world, the real world view isn't yin or yang or even a combination of the two, although that's a nice model, but it's really something that is subtler and more holistic and uh, far more wonderful uh, than those limiting concepts can express. Well, uh, that, it's true that words are only a part of it, but they're also a useful part. And the fact that you came here means that you want to speak mm -hmm. and listen, because this is a lecture and a symposium and a discussion, and our tools are words. So you knew this when you came here. You can, you can go somewhere else and do other things, but here we're dealing with words, and that's all right. Well, could I just uh, ask, excuse me, Wes, um, as opposed to what? What would be the, b your question is really, what is the most direct expression that we can give to these enormous principles which we consider dynamic and real, right? And what would be some possible suggestions? I'm, I'm saying at the heart of all this, isn't it, aren't we really aiming at a holistic experience and an experience which is not necessarily tied to words or to communication or to structure, but an experience which we've all gotten a glimpse of at one time, and that's really why we're here. Mm -hmm. We're hoping to strengthen this holistic experience that we see in ourselves. I think all we can do is remove obstacles towards the awakening, the realization, the well, enlarged um, consciousness. We I'm can't do any more than that. I haven't come to uh, have a holistic experience. I have to come to discuss a conceptual structure. That's why I see my role. I, I don't deny the value of the experience, that the experience is primary, but it's also valid to, uh, to talk about it and, and discuss the conceptual framework. I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, for the last 200 years, at least in the West, our values, one of the values has been rationality. And people have been looking up to scientists to provide answers. Lately, and it doesn't mean uh, thorough survey conducted and the values are changing. I think people are beginning to feel that science is not providing all the answers. It has, it's their selfish, they their own interests, and this holistic method is, is not even heard of. I think it seems to be very new, I think very wholesome approach. I think the scientists may face the possibility of being left on the side as the humanity goes forward, and they may look to some, something else for answers. Uh, do you have any comments about how s the scientific world views this? Are they aware of the changes? Uh, I think they are aware of it uh, very much. In, in my field, in, in theoretical physics, there's a great concern about the fact that physicists are no longer able to communicate with the rest of society. And there are lots of articles and special issues of journals on, on this fact. And this was, by the way, uh, the main reason why my book was accepted in physics circles, because although they didn't buy the mysticism, they, they still recognized that I could communicate the physics. So there is great concern about this. And uh, I think the first part of your comment uh, was something that I should have mentioned somewhere along the line this weekend, that uh, one of the developments of, of this, one of the uh, consequences, let's say, of this, the new philosophy of physics will be to put physics itself in its proper place and to um, fight against the scientism that has uh, dominated our culture, to, to believe that the rational mode and the scientific approach will solve all the problems. It's very good very often, but at other times it's, it, it's limited. And at other times, again, it can't do anything. It's just the wrong approach. And that's very useful to recognize. So I don't think that physics or science will be left on the side completely, but uh, it will be put in its proper place. And that's a very good development. One minute to go, we'll take one more question. Who's the lucky person? Oh, so would you comment on Kirillian photography? Uh, well, has the question been heard? Uh, comment is asked on Kirillian photography. 
It's a technique to uh, make visible electromagnetic phenomena that accompany uh, living organisms and uh, give rise to effects around the body or around the leaf and so on. And I'm not an expert on this question, but as far as I understand, uh, the phenomena are pretty well understood now. There are about seven effects that people have uh, have uh, isolated and they uh, know how to identify, one of them being increase of moisture in certain circumstances, measuring of moisture of uh, the surrounding field of the body and another one is skin resistance and so on. There, there are seven of these effects that give rise to this so-called Killian aura. So it's, I think the effect is pretty well understood now, but so far I haven't seen anybody using it for anything. So as far as I know that people don't make use of it yet. And I must say the people who do research in this area uh, very often are not very qualified and don't have a very good scientific methodology, so there's very little progress, and they're pretty sloppy in general in their research. Well, I think there's any other comment on the yeah. Tiller? Yeah. Tiller is there. I think I'll speak to the gentleman for a virtual